All right, we're going to get started. Um, so how, how's everybody doing today? You guys had a good long day? I don't know. So yeah, thumbs up. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Nice. All right. So this is the quantum computing triple play uh, presented by UT, the UT Quantum Collective. Um, so we're an org dedicated to uh, undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate students interested in quantum computing. Uh, we organize uh, social events and stuff. We'll have a slide up there just to talk about ourselves. But um, this event is meant to be a little bit of outreach for people who are at any level of uh, quantum computing just to get a little more familiar with it. Um, so we can get started. Nice. Uh, so this is today's agenda. Uh, we'll start off with our welcoming remarks right now. Um, and then right after, we'll have Scott Aronson talking about the uh, history of quantum computing since Democritus, uh, Denise Ruffer, uh, who will be talking about uh, quantum hardware research and industry, and uh, Worley, that's short for William Hurley, uh, CEO of Strangeworks, who will be talking about uh, software making quantum computing accessible uh, to everybody across the world. So, and then after that, we'll have refreshments and networking. At any time, if you guys are thirsty or hungry, there are cookies and sodas at the back, along with plates and napkins, and there'll be uh, pizzas arriving uh, later. So you can go up at any time and uh, grab some food. Um, that's all free, of course. Yeah, we're not charging. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about this event. Uh, we were very impressed by the RSVPs we got on Eventbrite. Um, as you can see, uh, we have people from all around the world. Uh, every single continent except Antarctica. Unfortunately, we couldn't get any penguins to RSVP, but we tried our best. Um, yeah, and then the uh, next slide. Yep, so this is a breakdown. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but when you RSVP, you expressed uh, what level of quantum computing experience you have. And so um, these, this is a breakdown across all the different categories. Of course, we've got the most for people who are quantum curious, just in getting introdu introduced to uh, quantum computing. But across the rest of them, it's pretty. It's a pretty even split. Um, so we're very pleased to see that. And so we have a very diverse audience today. Uh, yeah, next slide. Oh, and note that uh, population size of 679. That's pretty big. Anyway, um, thanks to all of our uh, sponsors and supporters for making this happen. Um, so Adam Computing, Strangeworks, QSecure, uh, QSecure, uh, Quantum Computing Report, the Quantum Curious, and the Quantum Information Center at UT Austin. Um, so yeah, all of all of uh, our sponsors were very instrumental in making this event happen. And uh, yeah, we also have a number of collaborators. Um, so uh, you can take a look at the slide if you'd like to see them. Um, but all of these people were very people in organizations were very helpful in uh, getting this event off the ground. Yeah. Next slide. All right, and uh, this is a little slide about uh, the UT Quantum Collective. So we're an org at uh, UT Austin dedicated to helping students like you get interested in quantum computing. Uh, we run hackathons every fall, uh, directed research reading programs every week or so for beginners and also intermediates. Um, we have learning labs, which help you get uh, certified through the uh, IBM Qiskit uh, certification process. Um, so that'll work through the IBM textbook on quantum computing. And we also have guest speaker events like this one today. Um, so all of that and more uh, you can get access to uh, through our Discord. Uh, so we'll leave this slide up at the end of the event, but if you guys wanna scan that and join our Discord and get uh, involved, that'd be great. Um, yeah. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, introduce Scott Aronson and then we'll get going. So, uh, hey guys. Uh, first up is going to be Dr. Scott Aronson, who is the David J. Bruton Centennial Professor of computer science at the University of Texas at Austin, and also the director of its Quantum Information Center. In addition to making foundational contributions to quantum complexity theory, Dr. Aronson keeps the public honestly informed about what quantum computing can and can't do through his popular blog, Shadow Optimize. He is also the author of Quantum Computing Since Democritus, which you have all received a link to, in which he takes a Socratic tour through some of the deepest ideas in math computer science, and physics. So without further ado, Dr. Scott Aronson. All right, can you hear? So um, um, hi, everyone, So uh, and welcome here. So um, uh, I should say I had nothing to do with organizing this event, uh, but my uh, my purpose here is, well, first of all, to thank the people who did organize it. Uh, you know, it is great to see uh, more uh, uh, quantum activity at UT. And uh, 
especially you know the the uh, students who have uh, uh, who are part of this quantum collective and who are putting on events like this one. So um, uh, so so we have a small but growing quantum information center uh, here at UT, uh, which is uh, between computer science uh, where I live and uh, physics and ECE, electrical and computer engineering. And you know we're hoping to get uh, maybe math and chemistry involved too. But we've got a, a few uh, a faculty. Uh, we've got you know a great group of uh, postdocs and uh, grad students, undergrads. Uh, we have affiliated people at the uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center and the Applied Research Lab uh, in in North Austin. So, uh, and you know uh, 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 Austin has become more and more of a you know a, a startup hub. Uh, you know there's people are, are moving from Silicon Valley to here uh, more than the reverse. Uh, and we, we do now have some quantum computing startups uh, such as uh, Strangeworks, and you will be hearing about that uh, later. So um, what I thought that I would do, both because it's the easiest and because it's the most fun is just take questions. So um, I am happy to field whatever is on anyone's mind uh, about, you know, uh, um, uh, you know the theory of quantum computing about the quantum computing industry about quantum algorithms you know i may not know the answer but you know i can i can at least spout about about just about anything so uh so i'm i'm, I'm happy to to talk about whatever people would like me to um all right you want to Well, okay. The, I mean, there are a bunch of approaches, you know, being pursued uh, to hardware implementation of quantum computing, and and you're going to hear uh, ab about some of them. Uh, you know, there is um, um, superconducting qubits, which was what, for example, Google used for its uh, quantum supremacy experiment in 2019. Uh, there's um, um, photonic qubits. Okay, which is what's used for boson sampling, for example. That was uh, the other route that was taken to uh, demonstrate quantum supremacy over the past couple of years. In that case, by the uh, group of Chao Yang Lu and Jianwei Pan uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, USTC in China. Uh, uh, optical qubits are also uh, being used by uh, uh, the startup Psi Quantum in Palo Alto, which uh, uh, Psi Quantum. Uh, uh, it's a startup company, you know, they've raised about a billion dollars in, in venture capital to try to do this and, you know, they have 100 people so, uh, you know, that might or might not succeed but okay, you know, we, you know, e e each, e you know, there, there is um, um, trapped ion qubits, which is being pursued by, uh, uh, for example, um, 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 ion Q, okay, which, which actually just, you know, went public recently. Uh, there's um, uh, topological qubits, which is being pursued by Microsoft, uh, you know, and they've, they've uh, uh, Microsoft has placed a huge bet on that. And there are yet other approaches like cold atoms, um, 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 silicon dots. Okay, uh, now, you know, the, the fact that there is this variety, this whole, you know, zoo of different approaches, on the one hand, it's, it's great that we have all these ideas to, to explore. On the other hand, you should be worried about it, right? Because this is not how classical computing has worked, right? Classical computing, there was, uh, you know, I mean, there, there were a bunch of ideas in the early days of, you know, how would you actually build a scalable classical computer? But then eventually one technology came to the fore, namely the integrated circuit, you know, made of transistors, uh, made of silicon transistors, and it just destroyed everything else. Okay, it was just so much better than than any competitor that it just became the thing that we all rely on. And you know what a lot of people would like to know today is well, well, what is the transistor of quantum computing, right? And uh, I think it's fair to say that you know if that exists, then it, it hasn't been built yet. You know, or and and we might not even know what it is. I mean, uh, if you talk to the partisans of any of these hardware approaches, at least when I talk to them, you know, while I'm talking to them, they'll have me completely convinced that their way is the only way to scale and that no one else has any idea what they're doing. The trouble is that then the next day I'll talk to a partisan of a different approach, you know, and, and they'll, they'll have me equally convinced. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the, the trouble is 
you know, the, the, like, like theory cannot resolve this question of like, which is the, you know, the, the which is, which is, the, which, which is the right hardware approach or the right combination of approaches. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it can inform the, the discussion, but, you know, you could say all of these approaches are trying to get to the same place, right? They're all trying to get to, you know, a universal set of uh, operations on qubits uh, that, that then, you know, if, if, if and when they succeed, then, then kind of the result is the same with any of them, right? It's a programmable universal quantum computer. Uh, the trouble is that we are just in this technological epoch right now where we can't yet get there, right? And because we're in that, you know, we are temporarily, uh, uh, I guess, stymied in trying to build a scalable fault tolerant quantum computer. Then the question becomes one of, well, what can you do with kind of the noisy hardware that we've got today? Uh, the more limited hardware where maybe we can only do, you know, 50 to 100 qubits. Maybe we can only do a thousand uh, operations on them, a thousand gates. Uh, maybe we can only do a limited, you know, non-universal set of operations. And then the differences between all these hardware approaches do become relevant, okay? But, uh, you know, if there are some people hope that topological quantum computing will have a sort of natural error correction built into it. And, you know, if so, that that could sort of serve as the transistor of quantum computing. But, you know, the, so far, not even a single qubit has been demonstrated by that route. You know, Microsoft is working on it. You know, they claim to be making progress. But you know, right now we're at zero qubits by that approach compared to let's say 50 qubits by the um, superconducting or trapped ion approaches. Okay, so uh, yeah, another question. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's, a, that, uh, uh, that's a good question. You could say ultimately the, the only benchmark that we care about is like, what interesting problems can you solve with this device? Okay, and what problems could you can you solve with this device that a classical computer would not have been able to easily solve, right? So you could say, you know, that is the ultimate benchmark, right? All other benchmarks derive their legitimacy from that benchmark, right? You know, like they are only interesting insofar as we think they're telling us something about that benchmark, right? And I emphasize this point because, you know, people have come up with benchmarks. I mean, a few years ago, IBM came up with this thing that they called quantum volume, right? Uh, which is, you know, one way to try to measure, you know, where, you know, I mean, what's, what's, what's good about it is, you know, you don't wanna just ask how many qubits do you have, okay? Because then someone will come along and they'll have, you know, 100,000 qubits, but they can't control them. You know, they can't put them into the superposition states that, that we want. And in that case, well, who cares how many you have, right? You know, someone else will say, you know, well, well we can keep our qubits coherent for an entire day. Okay, but you know, that, that's only if nothing is being done to them, right? And they're perfectly isolated in this nitrogen vacancy center or whatever, okay? And so then again, you know, who cares how long it's coherent if you can't operate on it? Right. So, you know, quantum volume was one attempt to try to combine together all the different, you know, desiderata that you need. Like you need a lot of qubits, you need high connectivity, you need them to maintain their coherence, you know, over like a computation of a, of a, of a, de of a reasonable depth. Right. And then, uh, you know, so, so you can invent one metric that kind of puts together all of those things, you know, and that's, that, that's an improvement over just, you know, the most naive thing of like asking someone how many qubits do they have, right? But I have to say that I do worry about Goodhart's law. You know Goodhart's law? It says that like as soon as any metric becomes a thing that is optimized on, then it ceases to be a good metric, right? So, you know, this is, this is a very, very common thing, right? That like as, as soon as you say, well, here's my numerical score for goodness of quantum computer, then you just incentivize you know, all the experimental groups to do like whatever uninteresting hack they possibly can to just increase that measure, right? And so, so I am not going to cede my judgment to any one of these measures, right? You know, and, and when any experimental group, you know, has a new uh, uh, announcement to make about what they built, basically, I just want to, you know, I, I, I want to hear all the details about it openly, right? And, you know, like, like, so one metric that I care about is, have they actually released a paper? You know, do they have a paper on the archive where I can see all the technical specs of their new device? Or is this just a press release 
you know, and a website where I have to try to work backwards, you know, from all this marketing ease and like and try to infer what they what they actually did on the actual engineering level, right? We have what? The archive is the repository of all the quantum computing papers. So yeah, so if you don't know about that, then that would be the very first thing to arxiv.org. Uh, that is where basically all math and physics and computer science papers uh, go or have gone for the past 30 years. Um, that's, you know, that's where you find the literature of quantum computing. That's like, you know, so, so again, you know, when someone, you know, if someone puts like a web page with a lot of pictures, right, like they're aiming at, you know, investors or at journalists right but if they put a paper on the archive that is when they are talking to other experts right and you know in general if someone is only talking to the public and they are not trying to bypass you know they're trying to not talk to the the experts who could evaluate their claims then you know in quantum computing just like with everywhere else you know that is that is a red flag right yeah yeah oh all right fine Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so so let's so let's back up a little bit. So so NISQ uh, is an acronym that stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. So this acronym was coined by uh, the physicist John Preskill, um, maybe maybe five years ago, uh, and uh, he was trying to refer to let's say you know the the current era in quantum computing. Uh, namely the era before we have fully scalable and fully error corrected devices. Okay, so as I was talking about before, you know, we are now and maybe, you know, for, you know, um, um, at least, uh, you know, I don't know how many more years, but for, you know, at least, you know, some more years, we will be in an era where we cannot yet build, you know, a fully uh, error corrected quantum computer. Like we don't have qubits that behave perfectly that we can just, scale to uh, as many of them as we want, uh, we will have noisy qubits that, uh, you know, you could only do some limited number of operations on before they lose their quantum coherence, before they lose their superposition uh, 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 nature. And, uh, you know, and we will be inherently very, very limited in what we can do with them. Okay, so the first really, really important thing for, for all of you to understand is that uh, as far as we know today, as far as you know, uh, uh, we can figure out, there might be no applications of quantum computing in the NISC era. Okay, uh, you know this goes against uh, you know like you know a thousand you know like almost every marketing thing that you will see. Um, you know, as someone who works in this field, I am telling you that it is nevertheless true. Okay, so, uh, you know, it, we will be lucky if we will be able to get any uh, uh, advantage with a NISC device for any useful problem. Okay, uh, we don't yet know how to do it. Okay, uh, so, you know, there are a whole bunch of algorithms that people publish, you know, about that, you know, you could implement in the NISC era, uh, like this, Q, this QAOA, which is, you know, this optimization method, a whole bunch of things for machine learning, for generative modeling. The one question that you have to ask about every single one of these things is, does it outperform a classical computer? Okay. And if the paper does not address the question of, does it outperform a classical computer, then assume that the answer is no. Okay. Because if the answer was yes, they would have said so. Right. Uh, there is, you know, I would say this is like the er problem of quantum computing, you know, of, of, of quantum computing research, right? That it's not, it's never enough to just do something with a quantum computer. You know, you have to beat what a classical computer could do, right? That is when it becomes interesting, okay? And, you know, as, as simple as it sounds, right? You can find, you can go, you know, on the archive, for example, you can find thousands of papers about quantum algorithms that will like investigate all different aspects of them and then just either, just not address at all, like how does this compare to the best classical algorithm? Or else they'll say, well, that's just a question for the future, right? You know, we can't answer that, that's too hard. Okay, so, so um, I think that the best bet for getting a speed up in the, you know, for getting a speed up for a useful problem in the NISC era is probably some form of quantum simulation. Okay, if it can be done at all, I think that our best bet is uh, you know, to learn something new about condensed matter physics, 
you know, about uh, uh, solid state systems, about high temperature superconductors, maybe even about, you know, models of quantum gravity, uh, conceivably even about chemistry. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, in these cases, uh, you know, we, we have examples where at least the number of qubits looks very favorable with, uh, you know, 100 to 200 qubits. You could already start learning new things about these, these you know, interesting quantum systems, uh, some of which are scientifically interesting, some of which are even, you know, commercially relevant or, you know, relevant to drug design or materials design or other practical areas. Okay, the big problem that we still have with that is that uh, you know, all of these quantum simulation algorithms, they seem to require uh, a depth, a circuit depth that is in you know, the millions, okay? Uh, or, or, you know, and uh, we can't do that now, okay? Without error correction, you can, you know, what people can do today is they can do maybe a depth of 25, you know, like 25 layers of operations, okay? This is why error correction is so important. This is why error correction is the big prize that all of the, you know, Google and IBM and Microsoft and Amazon and, you know, all of the others, you know, and PsiQuantum and IonQ and all the others who are, who are pursuing this are, are now racing toward. Okay, once you get error correction, then you're no longer limited in depth. Okay, but before you have error correction, you know, if you could eke out an advantage for a useful problem, then it will have to be by a circuit of a very small depth. You know, it is possible that you'll you will do something interesting for quantum simulation, for example, um, but we don't yet know how. Uh, and um, you know, uh, if we do get an advantage, you know, it is it is likely that that like we will first see advantages that are scientifically interesting. You know, that tell physicists or you know a, a chemists something that they didn't already know. Uh, that might come before we see advantages that are commercially interesting. Right, which is you know uh, uh, you know maybe maybe a a a a harder requirement. Okay, but you know I, I ironically you know so, some of the very first things you might be able to do is just simulate models in theoretical physics, including like models of black hole evaporation or the early universe and things like that. That would then tell physicists in the relevant areas uh, interesting new things. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that you know we will be able to see near-term quantum computers used for that kind of thing. And you know, then the, the other thing, the other place where I would say we have a shot with near-term quantum computers is for sort of various cryptographic problems where we get to sort of design the problem however we want, you know, as long as uh, it is classically hard in the appropriate ways. So for example, you could imagine using a quantum computer to generate certified random numbers. Okay, now, of course, you know, it's very easy to, you know, there are lots of ways to generate random numbers, right? You don't need a quantum computer for that. Okay, but what's harder is if you want to generate random bits and then prove to anyone over the internet that you really generated these randomly. Okay, that is something that is needed. Uh, for example, if you want proof of stake cryptocurrencies, you know, if you want something like, uh, uh, you know, that gets the advantages of Bitcoin, but without like wasting a good fraction of all the world's electricity on, you know, an inverting a hash function, right? Proof, proof, proof of stake, proof of stake. So, so for proof of stake, you need to constantly run a lottery to decide who gets to add the next block to the blockchain. Okay, so you need some source of, of, of randomness that everybody trusts. Now, you know, a, a, a near-term quantum computer, um, you know, as a, um, um, I and others sort of observed, you know, four years ago could already be used for that except that we don't have a fast enough way to verify what the quantum computer is doing. Okay, but if, if someone manages to discover that, then, 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 then th that, uh, that could be an application of quantum computing that you could maybe already realize today. Uh, so, you know, now, now in addition to that, people are going to try these quantum algorithms for machine learning and for um, optimization with, you know, near-term devices. Uh, I mean, you know, a, a D, a one company, D-Wave, has been doing that for a while, right? You know, uh, I, I guarantee you that no matter what the results, they will be saying that it's revolutionary and that, you know, it, uh, it uh, um, you know, enables all these new applications. Okay, the, the question you're always going to have to ask is, what if you compare against the best classical optimization heuristics, right? Because so far, when we've done a fair comparison, we haven't seen a win there. Uh, but, you know, partly the question is experimental. People are going to have to try these algorithms out, you know, on uh, near-term quantum computers and try, you know, as hard as they can to honestly 
evaluate their, their performance in practice, you know, against the best classical heuristics like simulated annealing and so forth. So I hope that, you know, if nothing else, we're going to be, be able to learn a lot about the performance of these quantum algorithms by trying them out on, on, on these you know, devices over the next decade. I hope that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, so, so there, there are, uh, uh, okay, all right. The question was what kind of software startups are there in quantum computing? Uh, so, uh, you know, if you go back, like, let's say six years, you know, six or seven years, there was a, there was one quantum computing startup, right? That was D-Wave, you know, which was, you know, out there sort of, you know, saying things that, you know, some of us had some issues with, okay? Uh, nowadays, it's a completely different landscape. There's more than a hundred quantum computing startups uh, today, uh, you know, at, you um, uh, you know, like working on sort of every different aspect that you could imagine, right? Some of them are actually building hardware, you know, uh, IonQ, SciQuantum, uh, Rigetti. Okay, but there are many others that are, you know, uh, uh, building software. Like, so, so they're basically saying, well, we're going to create a quantum programming language. Okay, we are going to create uh, a tool for optimizing the size of quantum circuits. You know, like you, you give us a quantum circuit and we'll try to reduce its depth to make it easier to, to run on a, on a near-term device. Or, um, you know, they're saying, you know, we, uh, we will consult about quantum algorithms. So like you give us your application, we'll investigate what are the best quantum algorithms for that application, okay? Or, you know, we will provide an interface, uh, you know, a uniform interface to all different kinds of quantum computers, okay? So there are a lot of companies that I think are sort of hoping to become the Microsoft of quantum computing. That sort of, they have some platform that everyone else has to go through, okay? Now, from my perspective, you know, all of this, you know, it's, 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 it's as if people are sort of building up this tower, you know, building up all the different layers of the tower, Okay, and yet, you know, the bottom layer that it all rests on, the actual hardware doesn't exist yet. Okay, so, you know, this is the thing to understand about all of it, right? It's very hard to evaluate the tower before you sort of have seen the thing that it all rests on, right? And, you know, you could say, you know, personally, like the, pro the progress that excites me the most is the, you know, uh, um, you know, is, well, you know, besides just purely theoretical stuff, right, would be, you know, the progress that actually solidifies the base of this tower, right, that everyone else is going to have to build on. And, you know, you could say, well, you know, if, if you're doing something like designing a programming language, designing an interface, right, these are, these are human problems as much as they are technical problems, right, like a good programming language is one that will you know, uh, 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 um, um, spur, you know, a, a thriving community of, of developers, right, who, who, who build on it and so on. But, but how do you know the answer to those questions before you have, you know, the actual community of developers? And how do you get the community of developers before you have the actual devices, right? So it is, you know, so there are these chicken and egg problems, right? And, and to be, you know, in the quantum software space right now, to have a quantum software startup, you know, means, you know, get, for better or worse, it means sort of getting ahead of ourselves, right? It means, you know, trying to build, you know, the, these software tools for, you know, for, for underlying platforms that, that, that don't really exist yet, or that, you know, only exist in a very rudimentary form. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, that, that can be done, you know, and, and it's possible that some of these uh, so quantum software startups will even be spectacularly successful, right? And maybe, you know, one is very foolish not to invest in them, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it, it is sort of, it, it's not what I would regard as kind of the main technical problem that has to be solved in order to get from where we are to, you know, a world with scalable quantum computers. Right, uh, you know, so, so, you know, I mean, I, I like some of these startups. I think they have good people, you know, who are doing good things. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy if other people invest their money in them. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so quantum computing is a, uh, uh, is a different way of exploiting nature to try to solve computational problems than, than anything that we've been doing uh, in the past. Uh, 
it uses the rules of quantum mechanics to solve certain problems, you know, certain specific problems, uh, much, much faster than we know how to solve them with a classical computer. Okay, so, you know, the rules of quantum mechanics uh, have been, you know, at the core of physics since the 1920s, right? You know, they've not changed in all that time. Okay, but it was only in the early 1980s that a few physicists started asking the sort of obvious in retrospect question of, you know, what do those rules mean for computation? Okay, so, you know, now the central things that quantum mechanics says, you know, I, I, I won't really be able to do it justice in a minute or two, okay? But, you know, it says that, uh, you know, the, the states of physical systems are sort of much, much bigger than it naively looks like, okay? You know, you see like a system with, you know, let's say N particles, and you think, you know, well, that, that should take like, you know, roughly N numbers to characterize the state of that system, right? Because I, I need to specify what each particle is doing. You know, it's just uh, uh, like, you know, which ones it's connected to, you know, where is it in space? How fast is it moving? You know, maybe some internal state that it has. Okay, quantum mechanics says no. To describe a general state of N particles, you actually need a list of uh, uh, um, something like two to the N power numbers. Okay, so in particular, if I have a thousand particles, you know, two to the thousand numbers is already far more numbers than could be written down in the whole observable universe. Okay, uh, you know, so that is an absolutely staggering claim, you know, about the world. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, physicists have known it for a century, right? Well, what's amazing is just that it took as long as it did for kind of for people to really take it seriously and say, you know, what, what, what does it imply? Uh, but now the, uh, you know, the, 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 the next really crucial thing to say is that you can't directly see these numbers, okay? These numbers are called amplitudes. Uh, amplitudes are, are related to probabilities, okay? But they're not probabilities, okay? And for one thing, you know, a probability that something happens is always a real number from zero to one, right? You know, you never talk about a negative 30% chance of rain. That would just be nonsense, okay? Amplitudes can be positive or negative. In fact, they can be complex numbers. Okay, so an amplitude is a complex number that you have to assign to each possible way that a physical system could evolve. So for example, if you have a, a computer with a thousand bits in its memory, right, there are two to the thousand power possible configurations of those bits. Okay, and the rules of quantum mechanics say unequivocally that every one of those two to the thousand bit strings it has to be assigned its own amplitude. Okay, and that, but now, as I said, you don't directly see these amplitudes. Okay, uh, there, there are kind of two things you can do to these you know, lists of amplitudes. You can apply linear transformations to them. Okay, this is called unitary transformations. And you know, for the last hundred years, the form that the laws of physics have taken has been, you, know, spe you specify the unitary transformation that these amplitudes undergo, right? All, you know, I mean, with the exception of general relativity, basically all physics since, since that time, you know, quantum field theory, the standard model, you know, has all been just working out the details of what linear transformation gets applied to these amplitudes, okay? All within this framework of, 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 of quantum mechanics. Okay, and then the second thing you can do is make a measurement, okay? And famously, in quantum mechanics, measurement is treated as a very different kind of operation, right? It is, it is a destructive operation where uh, uh, you, you force the system to randomly make up its mind about which outcome it wants to present to you, right? And, and then the central rule there is that the probability that you see a given outcome is the squared absolute value of the amplitude for that outcome. Okay, that's called the Born rule. That's, you know, one of the main rules of physics that, that we know. Uh, and, and, you know, and whichever choice nature makes, like I might look at a qubit that has some amplitude to be, you know, a qubit is just a quantum bit. So it would have the form like A0 plus B1. Like it has some amplitude A for being zero and some other amplitude B for being one, right? And now uh, I can look at this qubit. I can ask it whether it's zero or one. If I do that, I will see zero with probability ab the absolute value of A squared, and I will see one with probability absolute value of B squared. And whichever one I see, you know, it, uh, the qubit will then stick with that choice. Okay, so if it says one and I look again, then, you know, and nothing's happened in between, then it's still one. 
Okay, so, so again, I can make these, the, these linear transformations on my, my vector of, of size two, to, my, my enormous vector of amplitudes of size two to the N. Those are de completely deterministic. There's no randomness there. Those are uh, reversible. Those are continuous. Or I can look, I can make a measurement, okay? Which in practice means sort of I, I get the state of my quantum bits, my qubits, and I do something that records it on something much larger that I can actually look at and see, right? You know, so, so it's no longer a microscopic state, but for example, you know, a photon like goes into a photo detector and it either clicks or doesn't click, right? Uh, depending on whether the photon was there. Okay, and now I no longer treat it as a superposition, right? Now I treat it as just a definite outcome, which has happened with some probability, which is the squared absolute value of the amplitude. Okay, so that that was that was my attempt to explain quantum mechanics in two or three minutes. Uh, if you want uh, uh, the whole story, uh, you should you know take a course. Um, you know, so I should say I, I do teach an undergrad course, uh, quantum information science here, where we go through this. Uh, uh, Brian Lacour uh, also teaches actually a freshman course here at UT, and I'm glad that you know many many other universities have courses on this stuff, which actually don't require much of anything in the way of physics background. Right, the main, um, I don't remember the course number. It's called quantum information science. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so, so, uh, uh, you know, the main prerequisites, you know, for a course like that are linear algebra and complex numbers, right? We actually don't have any, any uh, physics prerequisite for this course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, all right, <laughs> the, uh, uh, to talk about the different quantum error correction techniques, okay? So, um, uh, so, so you know, the, the possibility of quantum error correction, you know, of doing it at all was very non-obvious, right? It was discovered by Peter Shor, you know, same one from Shor's factoring algorithm in uh, 1995. Okay, and what quantum error correction says basically is that you know it is possible to take a logical qubit, so like you know a superposition of the zero state and the one state, you know that we are interested in. Okay, and you know the, the trouble is if I just try to store that in the state of a single electron, a single atom, something like that, it's very fragile. Okay, if any stray particle you know uh, uh, comes through and just carries away the information about whether that qubit was a zero or a one, then it is as if the qubit has been measured, okay? So this, this, is, this is a really key point, right? From, from, a, from a modern perspective, all that measurement really means is that you yourself or, or you know, your measuring device kind of becomes quantumly entangled with the qubit that you are looking at. Right, like the information from the qubit leaks into you, into you know the the state of your computer, the state of your brain, the state of your environment. Okay, and but now anything else that had that same leaking effect, you know, even if it's just some radiation in the room or something, right? If it carries away the information about whether the qubit was zero or one, then you know, as far as you can tell, looking at the qubit, it will be as exactly as if someone had come along and measured that qubit. Okay, and if someone measures the qubit, then you know it no longer has its superpositions uh, a state, and so you you know it is no longer useful to you for quantum computation for sort of beating a, a classical computer. So uh, so what this means is that is that uh, qubits have to be somehow very carefully protected from unwanted interaction with the environment. Hey, quantum error correction is the field that studies how to do that, okay? And uh, so the, you know, it was initiated by uh, Shor's discovery in 1995 that you can take a single qubit that you wanna protect and you can encode it into an entangled state of nine, uh, in, in, in his case, nine uh, physical qubits. Okay, in such a way that if any one of those nine qubits was to leak its state into the environment, you know, you can still, you can measure, you can realize that something bad happened, and you can perfectly recover uh, the information that you cared about from the other eight qubits. Okay, so that was the first example of a quantum error correcting code 
since then, people have discovered you know, many, many, many more quantum error correcting codes. And there is a whole theory of quantum error correction now mirroring the theory of classical error correction, you know, that started with Claude Shannon in, in, in 1948. Okay, so, uh, so, so we know a lot, you know, about in principle of now about how to do this. Uh, people are just now, you know, beginning to demonstrate quantum error correction in the lab. Uh, and, and right now it's still, you know, you still have to squint to see whether there's any net win compared to if you hadn't done error correction at all, right? So it's still very marginal, okay? But, you know, the hope is that once your, you, your qubits get good enough, you know, at least what, what the theory says is that you pass a certain threshold where then each round of error correction, once you're past this threshold, makes your qubits effectively better and better, makes them better and better protected. Okay, so that, you know, in the limit, you're just using noisy, using noisy qubits, noisy physical qubits, in order to simulate effectively noiseless qubits, right? And you might need, you know, thousands of noisy qubits to simulate just a single noiseless qubit. Okay, so, you know, there's a, there could be a very high overhead that you have to pay, but, you know, but, but the idea is you would just pay that. And then, uh, uh, you know, now, now we are not yet at the threshold where, you know, each round of this becomes a net win. You, you can say like, we're not yet at the break even point or, you know, the critical point, if you want to think of it as, you know, as if it were a nuclear reaction. Okay, but you know, that is, that is the big goal today that, you know, uh, uh, I would say, you know, the, the different companies are closing in on. Now you asked about different approaches. So I would say that, you know, if you want to make a, like a, a division, the two main approaches would be software error correction and hardware error correction. Okay, so, so uh, you know, the underlying theoretical ideas are the same uh, or are very similar, but, you know, you can either just try to, you know, take, a, a, um, you know, if a physical substrate like trapped ions or um, superconducting qubits that has kind of no natural error correction, and then you could try to build in the error correction at the software level. Right by just constantly measuring your your physical qubits to see when errors have happened, and if they've happened, then you you apply the appropriate correction operations. Okay, and this would be the analog of something that John von Neumann discovered in the 1950s. So uh, you know, at that at that time, people were very worried that classical computers would never scale because obviously you needed vacuum tubes or electromechanical relays to build them, but these were very unreliable components. And as you integrate more and more of them, then the probability of a failure somewhere approaches 100%. So how do you do this, right? So John von Neumann, John von Neumann. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, yeah, so uh, um, uh, what? Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 so von Neumann, who was, you know, one of the famous mathematicians of, you know, and physicists of the 20th century, uh, proved a theorem that said that uh, um, as long as your rate of failure per vacuum tube is small enough, uh, you know, you can uh, use noisy vacuum tubes to simulate noiseless ones, right? You can use error correcting codes. You can have sort of, you know, uh, layers upon layers of vacuum tubes that are basically checking each other's work you know, taking like best two out of three, you know, doing tricks like that. And as long as your physical error rate is small enough, you can effectively push it to zero. Now, uh, as, as amazing as it was, von Neumann's uh, uh, great insight ended up mostly not being needed, okay, in the, you know, com computing revolution. And why was that? Well, it was because by the 60s, we started building integrated circuits of transistors, and those almost never fail. You know, your laptop will maybe have a hardware failure about once per year when a cosmic ray hits it, okay? Uh, you know, if you have a data center the size of Google, then you, you actually are worried about cosmic rays. And, you know, and, uh, uh, but, you know, for, for most of us, we just, you know, we can just assume that our transistors are perfect. Uh, so, so, you know, it's natural to ask, well, couldn't we do something in quantum computing that was like that? Right. Instead of having to do all of this laborious error correction at the software level, you know, analogous to what von Neumann said to do in the 50s, why couldn't we build, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, qubits out of some physical substrate that was just sort of naturally robust against error, right? Like the transistor uses solid state physics to just sort of, 
a, a snap to you know either on or off like you know current or no current right to sort of you know take a continuous signal and snap it to something discrete you know so what why why can't we have uh, qubits that would sort of naturally be protected against decoherence. And there is a major proposal for how to do exactly that. That is topological quantum computing. Okay, that is the thing that, um, uh, you know, is most associated with the physicist Alexei Kataev, who, you know, came up with it in the, in the, in the mid, in the, I guess, 1997 or so. And, um, you know, and, and, and the idea is that, you know, if you could create you would merely have to create a new type of material, which has never been seen in nature. Uh, 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 but it would, it would have to support uh, uh, quasi particles. That is like, it would have to have excitations on it that behave like particles, but neither like bosons nor like fermions, right? Bosons and fermions are the two basic types of particle that make up our world. Uh, uh, you know, and they're each defined by the type of statistics that they satisfy. Like if I take, you know, bosons or like, you know, photons, for example, uh, you know, but if I take two identical bosons and I swap them, then nothing happens. Okay. If I take, you know, fermions are matter particles, okay. Quarks, electrons, you know, neutrinos, you know, these are, these are all fermions. Okay. If I take two identical fermions and I swap them, then the amplitude for that state of the universe gets multiplied by minus one. Okay. You know, one consequence of this is that you could never have two fermions in the same place at the same time. That's called the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, that's the reason for the stability of matter. That's why we don't all just collapse into nothing. Okay, uh, uh, bosons do not have the exclusion principle. Okay, and in fact, if you look at a laser, for example, that has tons and tons of photons in exactly the same quantum state. All right, so now the idea with topological quantum computing is you're going to create a new type of particle which cannot exist in three dimensions. It can only exist on a two-dimensional surface. And they have statistics that are neither fermionic nor bosonic. Uh, but you know, they, they, um, uh, some complicated thing happens each time the paths of two of those particles go past each other. So each time they braid around each other. Okay, And the idea is that just the pattern of braiding of the paths taken by all of these particles that will be what expresses your quantum computation. And now here's the key feature, okay? Here's the key reason people are interested. That in order to cause an error in this quantum computation, uh, it would not be enough to just cha slightly change the path of one of these particles. You would have to actually change the topology of how the particles are braided around each other. Like take two particles that previously, whose paths previously crossed and make them not cross or something like that. Okay, so, so, so just the physics of your system gives you some intrinsic protection against error. Okay, and so that has been the dream for 20, 20 plus years now, that we could just realize this topological matter and then have a substrate for quantum computing, which would be sort of naturally, you know, physically error corrected, at least to some degree, right? So that the need for software error correction would be a lot less. Okay, as I said, that's been the dream so far, no one has managed to demonstrate a topological qubit, okay? But if, you know, whereas they have been able to demonstrate, you know, ordinary qubits and have, you know, actually, you know, gotten, you know, kind of impressively far with, you know, scaling up to systems of 50 or 60 of them. Okay, but, you know, this is why if someone manages to manufacture even one or two topological qubits, that they can get to, you know, interact with each other, apply a quantum gate to them, like that'll be a pretty big deal. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so, so uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the honest answer to that question is kind of a long one. It's a, well, it's an answer that takes like three lectures of my undergrad class, let's say. Okay. But I'll try to give you the short version. Okay. So uh, uh, our, our, you know, currently, right, how do we protect our credit card numbers, you know, when we order something over the internet, right? Well, we use, uh, you know, one of the, the great inventions of computer science uh, from the 1970s, uh, what is called public key encryption, right? We use methods of encryption where, you know, you and Amazon or, you know, you and whoever you are buying, you know, you're sending your credit card number to, do not ha ha uh, have to have agreed on a secret key in advance. Right, that would that would make the whole thing very impractical, right? Instead, you know, let's say Amazon 
he sends you a public key, okay, which you then use to encrypt your message, you know, like your credit card number, but in such a way that it can only be decrypted, we think, by someone who has the private key. Okay, and the private key Amazon is keeping to itself. Okay, now the most popular forms of public key encryption, you know, again, you know, invented in the 70s, things like RSA, okay, you know, the, the, the uh, Ravesh Shamir Edelman uh, 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 form of encryption, where there the public key consists of a gigantic composite number, okay, like a product of two enormous prime numbers, okay, and the private key consists of the prime factors. Okay, so, so what Amazon does is it generates two enormous prime numbers, let's say with, you know, thousands of, you know, or at least hundreds of digits each, keeps those prime numbers secret, multiplies them together to get a composite number, which they then publish to the world. Okay, and, um, uh, and, and then uh, what, what RSA discovered was a way to take a message, encrypt it using the composite number, in such a way that it seems to only be decryptable in any reasonable amount of time by somebody who knows the prime factors, right? So we're relying on the belief here that multiplying two huge numbers is much, much harder than factoring, you know, the result back, right? There seems to be an asymmetry between multiplying and factoring, which, you know, you might have, you know, encountered, you know, even, you know, just in, you know, learning multiplication in grade school, like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, uh, it seems harder to, you know, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to factor a number, you know, if I give it to you, then just multiply, you know, you know, you know, factor 91 versus multiply seven times 13, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and indeed the fastest classical methods that we know for factoring, you know, there are some very clever methods known, but they still take time that roughly grows exponentially. Right, like you know, exponentially, actually, with the cube root of the number of digits of the prime numbers that you're looking for. Okay, but now uh, one thing that was clear from the beginning is that if anyone could discover a fast algorithm for factoring huge numbers, then that would break the entire system. Okay, you know, now there there are other cryptographic codes that we also use, like Diffie-Hellman. You know, which also depend on other number theory problems where you could tell a similar story, right? If anyone can find a fast algorithm to solve that number theory problem, then the whole crypto system is, is broken, is insecure, right? So it all depends, you know, and, and this, this, this was the case all along, right? It all depends on this unproved belief about the hardness of a certain computational problem, okay? Now, now, now we can get to, you know, what was the, the famous discovery that really started the whole field of quantum computing, you know, in 1994, right? That was when Peter Shore discovered his fast quantum algorithm for factoring numbers, okay? So this was, you know, this remains to this day the most famous quantum algorithm that, that anyone knows, uh, or, you know, that, 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 that's been discovered. Uh, it is... Um, you know, it, it, what we call a polynomial time algorithm. So it's an algorithm that, it, it, you know, it uses a number of steps that grows basically like the number of digits and the number squared, roughly, okay? You know, as opposed to classically where we think you need an exponential number of steps, right? Or, or you know, you do with any known method. Okay, so, so if you use Shor's algorithm, you could factor, let's say, you know, a 2000 digit number, right? You know, which, which someone was using for their, public key in RSA, and you could thereby just break the whole system, right? You can then decrypt the message, you know, as well as, as well as Amazon can, okay? So uh, now, now, now how does Shor's algorithm work? You know, the, the, that's the part where I was saying I would kind of need three lectures to give you an honest answer, okay? But uh, the important points to, uh, that I would say to understand, is first of all, if you read almost any popular article about this subject, it will, it will tell you something that sounds appealing and easy to remember and is totally wrong, okay? It will say that, well, you know, a quantum computer works by trying every possible answer in parallel, you know? And so, so, so it's very simple how you break a cryptographic code. You know, it just, Shor's algorithm just tries every possible, you know, set of prime factors in superposition and then magically picks the best one. Okay, now the question you should ask yourself is if it were that simple, then why would you have needed Peter Shore to think of it? Okay, so, you know, in fact, it's not that simple, right? I'll tell you what the problem is, okay? If you just created an equal superposition over all the possible answers, right? And then you just looked at it, not having done anything else, 
then you know the rules of quantum mechanics, you know the ones that I talked about before, are completely unequivocal about what you're going to see. You're going to see a random answer. Okay, just you know a completely random answer. Okay, well now if if all you wanted was a random answer, you could have saved a lot of trouble in building a quantum computer, right? You could have just flipped a coin instead of you know spending however many tens of billions of dollars to build this device, right? So you know the entire hope. This is really really important. Okay, you can you know if 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 you don't listen to anything else I say, right? The 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 the, the entire hope of getting an advantage from a quantum computer is to exploit the way that amplitudes being complex numbers work differently from probabilities okay so so like if i want to know the probability you know of some you know of my computer producing some output like i might have to add up you know probabilities of many many different ways that that output could have been arrived at right but all of those probabilities will be positive numbers right they'll all be from zero to one Okay, uh, the, the key thing in quantum mechanics is that if you want to know the amplitude for something to happen, right, now I have to add up the amplitudes for all of the different ways that it could have happened. And if some of those amplitudes are positive, for example, and if others are negative, then they can cancel each other out. Okay, which means that the total amplitude is zero, and then which then means that that thing never happens at all. Okay, that's called quantum interference. Right. You know, Richard Feynman used to say that, you know, everything in quantum mechanics boils down to this one effect, you know, over and over and over. OK, so. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, uh, um, um, you know, the amplitudes are, are, are complex numbers, you know, complex numbers can point in different directions and they can interfere. They can cancel each other out. OK, so now the idea with every quantum algorithm you know, including Shor's factoring algorithm, right? The idea with every one of them is to somehow choreograph a pattern of, of interference such that for each wrong answer, each answer that you don't wanna see, some of the paths leading to that answer have positive amplitudes and others have negative amplitudes. So they interfere destructively and cancel each other out. Whereas for the right answer, the one you do wanna see, you get constructive interference, okay? All of the pa different paths leading to that have amplitudes that are reinforcing each other, that are all kind of pointing, you know, in, in the same direction. Um, uh, if you can arrange that, then when you measure, you will see the right answer, you know, and even if, if you did it less than perfectly, hopefully you'll see the right answer with a high probability, right? And then if you don't see it, you just repeat the algorithm from the beginning you know, repeat several times. And like, if, if each time I had a 10% chance of seeing the prime factors, then I've just got to run the whole algorithm like 10 times and, you know, chances are that I'll have seen it, right? So that's, um, now the tricky part is that you have to arrange this, this whole interference pattern, even though you yourself don't know in advance which answer is the right one. Because, you know, if you knew that, then what would be the point? Right, you could just use a classical computer, okay, and you have to do the whole thing faster than you could have just solved the problem with a classical computer, you know. So, so you know, it, the fact that there are any interesting quantum algorithms at all is kind of a miracle, right? It was not, you know, when Feynman and Deutsch started talking about this in the early 80s, it was not obvious that a quantum computer would be good for anything other than just simulating quantum mechanics itself, okay. So uh, you know, Shor's algorithm, you know, is what, you know, helped change that, right? And like, you know, gave people the idea that, well, you can actually just take a problem like factoring that has nothing to do with quantum mechanics and you can, you can, uh, you know, use quantum mechanics to solve it faster, right? Uh, now, uh, to explain how Shor's algorithm works, well, you know, you have to, you first need some, some number theory, right? So there's just some stuff, you know, that has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, but you have to reduce factoring to a different problem, okay? You reduce it to a problem called finding the period of a periodic function, okay? Uh, uh, and then, you know, it's still, that still doesn't, you know, it still seems, to, it seems to be out of the frying pan into the fire, right? Seems like, you know, this problem is at least as hard as your original one, because you could have a function that repeats with some exponentially long period. And then, you know, how do I, just by accessing this function at different points, how do I figure out what the period is? Okay, so then what Shor says to do is create a quantum superposition over all possible inputs to this function, right? Evaluate it on superposition. So now you have all the possible outputs of the function. 
Okay, and now you're still not done. Because now if I just look, then I would just see a random value of the function. Okay, but now what I do is an operation called the quantum Fourier transform. Okay, so I do a, a linear transformation on my list, my exponentially long list of amplitudes that has the effect of taking my list of amplitudes and Fourier transforming it for any of you who know what that means, right? Just changing the basis to the Fourier basis that then gives me enough information to see what was the period of my periodic function. Okay, so Shore had to show, you know, that, that first of all, that this actually works, that you can piece together the result, and also that you could implement this quantum Fourier transform acting on an exponential vector of amplitudes with only like a linear or quadratic number of, of elementary operations of quantum gates. Okay, so that, 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 is, that is all the stuff that I take three lectures to explain in my undergrad class. Okay, but you know, the, the important takeaway points are that to make this work, Shore had to exploit some extremely special properties of the problem of factoring integers, right? This is not just a general, you break any cryptographic code this way. Okay, and in fact, there are other cryptographic codes, including ones in widespread use that we do not know how to break, even using a quantum computer. Okay, and there is a whole field today called post-quantum cryptography or quantum resistant cryptography, okay, that studies, you know, how do you design cryptographic codes that will still be secure even in a world with quantum computers? And people have a lot of ideas about that. Okay. Uh, you know, and 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 the most natural reaction if someone builds a quantum computer will just should just be that we should all upgrade our web browsers and our web servers to use these post quantum crypto systems and you know a NIST uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology is trying to formulate standards right now for for exactly those, those kinds of systems. Uh, um, it's just that you know uh, the you know the what, what for for better or worse what we use today on the Internet is mostly systems that are not secure against quantum computers okay RSA Diffie Hellman elliptic curve cryptography all of those could be broken and migrating away from those you know could be a big effort and it might be that you know it'll be uh, like like it, it, you know, you'll have to drag people kicking and screaming to make that effort until they see that an actual quantum computer is imminent right and then and then maybe it'll make the effort to 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 upgrade all of their their legacy code and their legacy hardware all right yes uh yeah all right all right sure so um so 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 my field is computational complexity theory that sort of studies the intrinsic difficulty of uh of different problems maybe i should use the board um so uh, um, this marker doesn't work. Um, okay, so so what we what we generally do is we sort of organize computational problems into classes, you know, depending on what kinds of resources uh, are able to solve those problems, right? So the most famous complexity classes are called P and NP. Uh, P being sort of all of the yes or no questions that are solvable by a conventional computer uh, in a polynomial amount of time, meaning using a number of steps that scales at most like the size of the problem raised to some fixed power. Okay, so what are examples of problems in P? Okay, I give you a graph and I ask you, is it connected? You know, like is every vertex reachable from every other vertex, right? Um, I give you uh, um, a, uh, um, uh, a number, I ask you whether it's prime or composite. That one, it is far from obvious that it's in P. That was only proven in 2002, okay? Um, um, but, you know, most of what we would do with our computers on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, linear programming, to take an example, you know, versions of, you know, multiplying, sorting, you know, these are all polynomial time problems. Okay, now the next really important class is NP. Uh, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time, okay? And this is the class of all of the problems where, you know, it, it, it's slightly subtle, okay? But it's the, it's the class of all the problems where there is a polynomial time algorithm to check an alleged yes answer, okay? So if someone claims to have solved it, then they can give you a witness that you then just check and it's either right or it's wrong, 
right? So factoring would be a good example, right? Like it might be very, very hard to find the prime factors of a 3000 digit number. But if someone presents you, they, they say, here are the prime factors, then it's very, very easy to check them, or at least easy for your computer to check them, right? Because it just, it multiplies them together. And, you know, as I said, there are even ways of checking that, 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 that the numbers are prime. Okay, now, um, at the top of NP are the famous NP complete problems. Okay, and what it means uh, for a problem to be NP complete is, is that you're sort of, you're in NP and you are maximally hard among all NP problems. Or, or in other words, like the NP complete problems are the problems in, in NP, sort of the easily checkable problems to which every other easily checkable problem can be easily reduced. Okay, so, you know, it's not obvious that there are any NP complete problems. Okay, the great discovery in the early 70s that sort of started theoretical computer science as a subject, you know, was that there are or computational complexity was that, you know, not only are there NP complete problems, but sort of the great majority of the, you know, uh, combinatorial search and optimization problems that we care about in practice are NP complete. Okay, so some famous examples would be the traveling salesperson problem, you know, finding the shortest route that visits a collection of cities, maximum clique, like find 500 people on Facebook who are all friends with one another, uh, you know, given the dimensions of a bunch of boxes, can they be fit into the trunk of your car? Uh, um, Sudoku, um, Super Mario are actually known to be NP complete. Um, uh, so, you know, most problems involving kind of satisfying a whole bunch of constraints. And then, you know, there's this sort of intermediate zone, right? We think that there are, and we know, the, the, you know, so, okay. So, so you could say the, the great question of the, of all of, you know, the, the greatest unsolved problem of computer science, of theoretical computer science anyway, is the question, does P equal NP? That is, is there a polynomial time algorithm to solve the NP problem? Which is equivalent to asking, is there a fast, you know, is there a polynomial time algorithm to solve the NP complete problems? And if you discovered an algorithm for any one of them, then automatically it would imply algorithms for all of the rest. Okay, so that's the that's the famous P versus NP problem that you know is one of the seven problems of the millennium that has this, these million dollar prizes from the Clay Math Foundation. Okay, um, and then there is this weird stuff that seems to be in the middle. Uh, a famous example being factoring, okay? Factoring, we don't know to be in P. That's why we use it for public key cryptography because it seems to be hard, but we also don't know it to be NP complete. Okay, and in fact, it, factoring has extremely special structure that seems to prevent it from being NP complete. Okay, that structure was crucially exploited to design the RSA crypto system, you know, that we all rely on to have, you know, electronic commerce. But then, you know, it, that same structure was also relied on by Peter Shore to give his quantum algorithm to solve factor. Okay, so now the, you know, the quantum generalization of P is uh, this class that we call BQP, which stands for bounded error quantum polynomial time. Okay, and this basically, this is the, think of it as the class of all the problems that are efficiently solvable by a quantum computer. Okay, so BQP, contains classical P, right? Anything that a classical computer can do, a quantum computer can simulate. Um, it contains at least one problem factoring, which is not known to be, or, you know, or, or known or believed to be in P. Now, uh, crucially, we do not think that BQP contains all of NP, okay? If there were a fast quantum algorithm for solving NP complete problems, then, you know, that would really be revolutionary, right? That would, uh, 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 you know, that, 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 that would change everything. And, and there was some early hope for that. And, you know, a lot of the popular articles will still, you know, just blithely write as if BQP contains entry, but we don't seem to live in that world. Uh, then in the other direction, there might be BQP problems that are not even in NP. So there might be problems that a quantum computer can solve, but where a classical computer cannot even verify the answer efficiently, let alone finding it. Okay, and, and a good candidate for something like that would be problems that involve simulating quantum mechanics itself. Okay, so that's, 
that's that's like the the you know there, there's again you know i teach a whole graduate course called quantum complexity theory but you know this is the five minute version of kind of the most important uh actors in the drama i would say so i don't know if you you want me to yeah all right sure yeah Uh, well, okay. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, at some point I would like to write a survey article about, you know, like a century of thought about why is quantum mechanics true. Right. And, you know, I don't mean, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I don't mean, you know, it's true because people did the experiments and they discovered that it was true. Right. That's not, that's not an explanation kind of like why, you know, just thinking a priori about the space of all physical theories. Why would you have, you know, it, are there reasons why you would have expected quantum mechanics to be kind of a natural choice within that space or even like, you know, an, an overwhelmingly preferred choice? You know, and I think, you know, one can give some answers to that question, but, you know, I'm not completely satisfied with them. And I just wanted to survey, you know, what, 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 what's been said about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we got like 700 something comments. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right, 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 right. No, but it also, you know, a lot of people who are very, very confident that they know the answer. Obviously, quantum mechanics is true because X, except then, you know, the next person has obviously it's true because Y, and, you know, Y is different from X. So. Uh, well, I'm not, I mean, I, 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 I there, are, there are a lot of things that I would like to pursue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. I would like to go ahead and introduce our next speakers. Uh, coming up next is going to be Denise Ruffner. She is the chief business officer of Atom Computing, which is a startup credited with building the first quantum computer made of nuclear spin qubits. Denise has been involved in the industry industry since its inception, holding executive positions at IBM, IonQ, and Cambridge Quantum Computing. Denise is also the president and founder of Women in Quantum, which is a vibrant community supporting women's participation in the emerging QC industry. And joining Denise is going to be her colleague, Robin Cox, vice president of control systems engineering at Atom Computing. And she's also le leading the development of Atom's very own, very own control systems. Please welcome Denise and Robin to the stage. Hey everyone, good afternoon. And I wanted to say thank you for including me um, to the group. And I also wanna tell you how difficult it is to talk after Scott Aronson. So I kinda of wanna like hide under the seat, um, but it's uh, my pleasure to be here and uh, wanna talk probably a little bit about hardware and some more beginning um, ideas on hardware. But let's first start off with uh, I think we just went through my history, so we don't have to talk too much, but been around in the quantum world for a while. Before that was doing high performance computing. I'm a biologist, I'm not a quantum scientist, so all technical questions go to my colleague Robin or to Scott. Um, maybe Robin, I'll have you introduce yourself real quickly next. Next slide. <laughs> Sure, I'm Robin Cox. I have a background originally in elementary particle physics. I worked on the CDF experiment at Fermilab as an undergrad and uh, the OPLO experiment at LEP, which was the predecessor to the LHC uh, at CERN as a graduate student. And for the past 20 years or so, I've been involved in digital logic design primarily. I've worked uh, on some space-based image processors. Uh, and I worked on telecom uh, IP for tr RF transceivers at analog devices. And uh, I was the R&D manager at National Instruments for the software defined radio product line. And this does actually make sense because our control system at Atom Computing uh, consists of, of RF devices that uh, stimulate laser systems. So it's uh, been a great path to kind of joined Atom Computing and have the rest of the career path make sense and come back to the physics side of things as well. And uh, I lead a team, uh, we have a small office in Austin of the control systems team, hardware, software, and firmware engineers who are building the classical electronics that are uh, the orchestrating our quantum computer. Thanks, Robin. So there is kind of a quantum computing hardware company in Austin. 
So I uh, wanted to bring that up. All right, let's go to the next slide. And what I wanted to do is talk a little bit of contextually about high performance computing and quantum computing, get into commercial quantum computing, a little bit about the history of commercial quantum computing. Um, you'll notice I uh, asked Scott a question about benchmarking quantum computers. We can talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, uh, Robin is going to talk about quantum computing, and then I'll end up talking about uh, this group, Women in Quantum, that I started, and mentoring opportunities that you all may want to take advantage of. And then also Steve from Strangeworks forwarded me some comments from the chat. And I'll also talk about uh, job opportunities and some really good resources for you um, to have moving forward. So let's talk a little bit about high performance computing. Um, next slide. So um, when I started at IBM, or I, I started at IBM a long time ago, but I was involved in the sale of the uh, uh, Sup Summit Supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab. And this is a giant computer. It um, uses the energy equivalent to 10,000 homes. It's the size of two tennis courts, millions of miles of cables. Hey, Worley, uh, lots of uh, $200 million. And it was like, of course, this computer could do anything that we ever thought it could do. It's so giant, right? And only to find out that actually there are a lot of problems that even Scott talked about that challenge these supercomputers. So there is a need for a new uh, computing technology because not everything can be solved via classical computing. And even if you build a bigger and bigger supercomputer, you're not gonna be able to solve a lot of problems. And so I just wanted to tell you, it also mentioned that a supercomputer like this is equivalent to a 50 to 60 qubit computer. Now that would be a fault tolerant computer. So we're not quite there yet today, but um, there's a lot of promise for quantum computing in terms of what the technology can bring to our world. If we go to the next slide, uh, commercial quantum computing so the first quantum computer, the kind of commercial quantum computer, was put on the cloud by IBM in May of 2016. And this was a really small computer. It had five qubits. And at the time, we were very proud of it, which, of course, we should have been. And what was interesting is we were all like, should we put it on the cloud? Should we not? Are people going to care? Who's going to use it? Maybe, maybe a couple of hundred people will use it. Kind of, we were like, let's just do this. And what happened is in the first week, over 7,000 people registered to use it, which blew us away. It wasn't what we expected. And if we look today, I looked at the IBM website, there's over 325,000 users running 2 billion circuits a day. So it's been quite a huge phenomenon. It's made quite an impact in the world that people can access a computer for free and use it. Now, there were a few other companies in May of 2016 that were also developing hardware. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Rigetti or Honeywell or INQ, who were also introducing hardware. And at that time in 2016, there were about 10 companies that were already developing software for quantum computers. So Scott mentioned earlier that there's, and I'll come up to numbers of companies, but you can see that this is an industry that's still very early. So the first computer comes out in 2016, it's six years later and the industry is just still growing. So I encourage all of you to stay interested in this industry because there's so much going on and there's so much in, in the future that if you're thinking about what should I do in my life, this is really a great industry. All right, next slide. What's interesting, and, and Scott again referred to this, is we show, I'm going to show you a couple different slides. There's 144 groups developing quantum hardware. This is um, a table from the Quantum Computing Report, which you guys can subscribe to as students very inexpensively. And it's always a great summary of what's happening in the quantum computing world. But you can see across the top that there are a number of different modalities of quantum computers. So, we don't really know what the winning modality is. So there's a lot of companies and academic labs that are all trying to develop computers and what we each think is the best modality, but we don't really know. And you can see just the names of some of the companies here. If we go to the next slide, um, 
I, I've kind of shown this information in three different ways just to give you an impact. But you can see starting in uh, 2018, you can see the number of hardware companies is growing. So we had 30 in 2018, and now we have about 60 in 2021, 2022. Um, the technologies we've seen on the market are superconducting, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, with IBM, with Google, uh, Rigetti. Uh, trapped Ion has come out, uh, and IonQ, Honeywell, or Continuum, as well as AQT out of Austria. Um, we believe that the next technology that's gonna come out is the neutral atom technology. And that's part of the reason why Robin is here today to talk about what atom computing is doing. And I do wanna say we do have publications on everything we've done. That was kind of, this is not a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but I want you also to see that there are other modalities for quantum computing. And I've listed companies underneath them and there's more companies than that. So the race is still on and we don't know who the winner is. Um, if you guys watch Twitter, there's a channel called the Quantum Bullshit Detector, which is one of my favorite channels. And uh, whoever that person is says this is a horse race and we don't know which is a horse and which is a mule. And I love that perspective because we all, we all do think we're right. and We all do think we're very committed to what we're doing but there's a lot of engineering challenges in every modality and, and we'll see what happens as this moves forward. I like the next slide and I just put it up because I thought it was a good illustration. Um, this is by a guy named Michel Kersec out of France where on the wheel you can see the different modalities and then kind of the spokes at the edge show all the different companies or universities developing the technology. So right now there's a lot of interest in hardware. There's a lot of interest in hardware development. It's countries doing it, it's academic labs, it's companies, a lot of activity. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is a point I really wanted to underscore. And that is there's a tendency to say, I have five qubits and you have four, so my machine is better. And that's not true. And so at IBM very early on, we realized that there has to be some way to express how good your quantum computer is. And so we put together um, a metric and it's on the next slide that we call the quantum volume. Bam, all right. And quantum volume was our first pass at how to benchmark a quantum computer so that if I look at the atom computing quantum computer versus another brand quantum computer, there might be some standard way we could measure how each computer performs and compare them. Now what's happened is since quantum volume was um, suggested, well, I'll, I'll mention right now the most uh, highest quantum volume today is that Honeywell or Continuum. Um, but since this metric was introduced, there's been a lot of discussion of, is this the right metric? What other factors did we miss in this metric? What else should we be doing? And so for that reason, go to the next slide. I asked Scott a loaded question. Um, IBM has introduced a new metric called CLOPS, where they look at compute time and they bring that into the equation. That may be one way to evaluate it. Uh, Atos has come up with something called Q-score. Uh, Quantum Economic Development Consortium has also come up with a benchmark. And DARPA ha is, uh, has awarded three different grants to try to create new benchmarks. So I think what we can see is, again, we're still working on technologies, but we're also still working on benchmarks and how we're going to compare system to system. And so I just want you to see that there's a bigger picture out there on really how you evaluate a system. And what's interesting is we talk about numbers of qubits, but if you go back a slide, other way, yeah, um, you can see that right now the world record is on a 12 qubit device. So there's a lot of people that have, we have 100 qubits, IBM has 100 plus qubits. It's really the quality of the qubits that matters. So someone can win with 12 qubits versus these other places that have much larger numbers of qubits. Okay. Uh, 
So there's a term in quantum computing called quantum advantage. Um, and that is, can you show an example of where a quantum computer exceeds the capabilities of a high performance computer? And there's really been one instance that I think of when people ask me for examples of, has anybody ever done this? And this was done actually in 2019 by Google. It was a very smart, well thought out experiment. Um, they did a calculation in less than four minutes that they say the world's most powerful computer would have taken 10,000 years to perform. So that second half of it is subject to a little bit of negotiation. Um, well, <laughs> but there is, yeah. So there's, there's some advantage. Uh, the, the tail end is, is uh, debatable. And there were immediately some papers published on that. Um, but there was some advantage shown. And, and to me, it was just a positive indication for quantum computing as opposed to a real big milestone. All right. I just wanted to show you there's a huge quantum ecosystem out there. There's startups worldwide. Um, I've broken out startups by country. This includes hardware and software startups. Obviously, there's a lot in the US. But there's startups in Uruguay, there's startups in India, there's startups in uh, Singapore, all over the world. So this is a phenomena that's really taking off. And it's really great to see that it's spread all over the world. Um, what's very interesting is that countries are really starting to get into the quantum computing race. And they, there is quite a bit of funding available um, in many countries, and probably the country that does the largest amount of funding for quantum computing is China. So China is outspending us. Uh, right now it's around $11 billion. The second country or the second biggest country investment in quantum computing right now is in Germany. Um, Angelica Merkel was actually a, or is a quantum physicist. And that's something she felt very strongly about that this technology could really affect the economy of the country and really wanted to invest very deeply in it. And I think over time, we're gonna see larger and larger investments by countries all over the world in quantum computing. I do wanna mention that the public market, so now we have quantum computing companies that are public. Um, this is something new. I'm gonna talk about hardware companies. So if we go to the next slide, um, Archer has been public probably for a couple years. It's a small company in Australia um, that converted from a mining company to a quantum computing company. But what's very interesting, last year, uh, INQ went public uh, through a SPAC, and we can talk about what a SPAC means, and Rigetti went public this year. So what that means is, for me, is that investors in the world are starting to recognize that this is a technology and the technology has promise and they're willing to invest money into this. So it's a great, again, a great recognition of the market and it shows to me that there's gonna be some stability in the market moving forward and that people are interested and it's gonna grow. All right, so if we look at the quantum industry journey, um, we started out, let's say in 2005, I'm going to say when IBM put their system on the cloud that um, systems, quantum computers can be built, which is pretty exciting in itself. Um, next, we're looking at systems with a path to error correction and then scaling systems and then finally exploring applications and watching applications pr proliferate. So we still have a long ways to go in the journey, especially around error correction, but it's a very good journey. And there's a lot of really great work being done by a lot of different places. All right. So now I'm gonna have Robin talk a little bit about atom computing and what we're doing to give you a flavor of a startups version. Sure, so atom computing was founded in uh, 2018 in Berkeley, California by Ben Bloom and Jonathan King. And Ben Bloom uh, did his graduate research uh, in atomic clocks, and this will make, hence the name atom computing. We're making our quantum computer from uh, optically trapped neutral atoms. 
And so it started with two people in 2018. And now this picture was taken about a year ago and now we're almost at 50. So we hired a lot of people during the pandemic. So next slide, please. So yes, Adam was founded in 2018. Uh, we, in July of this last, last year, we announced uh, our 100 qubit uh, quantum computer called Phoenix, which is located in our facility in Berkeley. And uh, we're, we're essentially creating qubits from uh, optically trapped strontium atoms. So uh, strontium, so we're, 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 we're taking a, a beam of strontium atoms and we're using a, a series of lasers to uh, cool them down because you know, it's a block of strontium in an oven. And so you know, the, 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 the atoms kind of fly off this block of strontium because you heat it up. But in order to actually create a quantum computer, you need to trap the atoms into an array. So we use lasers for all of this. Um, and so uh, we, we have succeeded in creating our 100 qubit system. And one of the advantages of using neutral atoms is they stick around, when you create a qubit from a neutral atom, it sticks around for a long time. So this is the so-called coherence time, which is effectively the time you can use the qubit to, to uh, perform computations. And compared to some of the uh, other, uh, <clears throat> other techniques, our qubits persist for tens of seconds. We, we, we actually have uh, uh, recently uh, had a paper uh, accepted by Nature Communications where we are uh, demonstrating our 40 second coherence time. Uh, in contrast, uh, some of the other, uh, other techniques are orders of magnitude less time that they're coherent. So the, the operations take place faster, but uh, they don't persist for as long. Uh, in, January of this year, we announced our Series B fundraising. So we raised uh, $6 million for a total funding of $80 million. And we're growing quite rapidly. We are uh, primarily hiring both physicists, primarily atomic physicists, and people who are specializing in quantum information, as well as my team on the control systems team. We hire more classically trained engineers, like hardware engineers, firmware engineers, software engineers. So even if you're not a, a, a quantum physicist, there is still definitely a place for you in the quantum computing industry. There's a lot of uh, talk about uh, amongst uh, people in quantum computing companies that there's gonna be a workforce shortage. So um, even if any one company doesn't succeed, there's going to be plenty of job opportunities for in the other companies for people who have uh, domain specific engineering knowledge in quantum computing. So next slide, please. So what is neutral atom quantum computing? Well, atom computing, I really like our company name because it basically describes what we do. We're creating a computer based on atoms. So we're using uh, individual uh, alkaline earth uh, atoms that, were that are trapped in a 2D array. And one of the advantages of using neutral atoms is they're intrinsically identical. Some of the other uh, techniques like superconducting transmon qubits rely on fabricating semiconductor devices and their kind of systematic uncertainties in, for each of the, you know, each of the, uh, the elements that is creating each qubit, but we don't have to deal with that with neutral atoms because all the atoms are by definition the same. We are also operating our device at room temperature, so we don't have to worry about huge ro roomfuls of uh, uh, cryogenic refrigeration electronics, and we don't have to have our electronics in a cryo environment. So, um, each uh, and one of the advantages on the control system side is we can actually uh, individually address the atoms, but we don't need a, a individual channels for each qubit. We can uh, we can with one channel of electronics uh, address multiple an entire row in our array. So it makes the control system a lot simpler. Uh, all of the atoms and qubits are controlled by laser, so we're taking advantage of a uh, decades of uh, experimental uh, uh, developments in atomic physics. So that's why we hire a lot of atomic physicists because they're setting up the lasers and the optics that are necessary to both to cool the, tr the qubits, create optical traps so we can have individual atoms and arrays. And then we're also using lasers to manipulate the atoms into the atomic states ne necessary to create one and two qubit gates. Um, so yes, I've basically uh, gone through this. So the initial step in our, in our uh, experimental sequences are we prepare the atoms. So the, there's a hot stream of atoms that's cooled and trapped with lasers. 
Uh, and then we're, we're, we have a group of people who are working on uh, creating series of algorithms uh, from the top level, from the, you know, the, the computer science, theoretical computer science algorithm all the way down the stack to how uh, to, to, to translating the algorithm into quantum gates, translating those quantum gates into hardware instructions. And then my team, we're kind of at the bottom where we're taking those hardware instructions and we're creating, we're, we're manipulating a series of lasers using uh, custom RF pulses. So we're, we're very concerned with, con with controlling very precisely the amplitude, frequency, and phase of RF pulses. And then we, we, uh, another part of the control system is we actually do our readout by taking high precision scientific imagers. So we're doing some real-time image processing to detect the atoms in a specific state. So we have this very clever technique where, um, so when we do a readout, you know, and uh, the qubit is either in a zero or a one state. And so what we do, we use this technique called shelving where, where qubits that are in the zero state, we kind of give them a kick with a laser into, uh, into a state where they just kind of hang out. And the ones in the one state, we give another kick and then they emit a photon that can be detected by the camera. So you can see in your array, which of the qubits is a one state. And then the control systems group is taking, is controlling the scientific imager and uh, running some uh, real-time DSP in a field programmable gate array to determine whether or not there are atoms in those particular spots. Um, so next slide, please. Um, yeah. So. As far as uh, what, what's important for a quantum computer, of course, the number of qubits, uh, but also uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we can either minimize the sources of uncertainty and error in our qubits, because in, 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 in a quantum computer, uh, errors can, can kind of uh, collapse the, the quantum state and then mess up your calculation. So we want to be able to either correct for the errors uh, that we do have and minimize the ones that we can control. Uh, I mentioned coherence time, which is effectively the amount of time that uh, we can do quantum computations and the, the, the more precise control over the lasers we have and the less noise in the laser system, the better off we are. We're also taking, we also need to control magnetic fields because we take advantage of, we use magnetic fields to, to split the atomic energy states uh, so we need one of the other uh, functions that my team is working on is a way to very, uh, very precisely servo the magnetic field. And when it's, we measure it, it's a little off, we kind of do a closer control to get it back to where we want it to be. And of course, uh, faster gates mean uh, faster computations. And so the way we achieve that in the atom computing system is through better vacuum systems. And we are actually considering uh, using cryogenics uh, we don't have to, but we can. So uh, next slide. Okay, yes, I, I alluded to our uh, kind of flagship quantum computer, which we're calling Phoenix, which is located in Berkeley, and it is a 100 qubit system. And this, this photo is uh, uh, mostly uh, optics for the laser systems. We have a whole bunch of lasers that, uh, that we need to, to uh, kind of there's a whole, there's a very complex sequence of, uh, you know, laser operations at specific times in order to a slow down the atoms so that we can trap them, create the traps, make sure that the array is fully filled. There's, uh, you know, just you, when we fill the array, typically only half of the sites are full. So we we have some atoms in reserve that we 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 use a series of RF pulses to kind of kick it the spare atoms into the array so it's fully populated. And then we can start our computation, quantum computations with yet another series of lasers to create the quantum, quantum bits. Um, so right now we're, uh, we consider Phoenix our basically our first generation system. And we're in the process of building our second generation systems, which are uh, we'll, our multiple systems that we're building in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, we're targeting approximately a thousand qubits for those. And it should, we're aiming for commercial availability early next year. Uh, and then uh, it's uh, on to larger, larger numbers of qubits with improved fidelity and improved uh, error correction capability. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it back over to Denise to 
to talk about uh, women in quantum, which we both are. So, <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even think about yeah. That. Okay. So um, let's pause for a minute. Any questions on quantum computing hardware ecosystem, neutral atom, quantum computing? Okay. Yes. Um, so my question was, like, I guess, how do you actually calculate, like, what to do with the lasers in order to, like, to the atoms and then measure that? Because, like, with photons and stuff, it's like, you have, you, like, linear algebra, like, you have the matrices and you can, like, calculate it. But it's like, what's the actual, I guess, process of, like, knowing what gates to apply with the lasers and, like, how to how it goes through each yeah so there we have an entire team of of atomic physicists who have created uh the, our so-called gate schemes so basically it's a <laughs> i'm like the wrong person to ask about like exactly so as essentially uh we've defined uh a series of of ex in order to create the qubits, you need to put the, the strontium or the other alkaline earth elements into excited states. And then uh, they, they, they have the correct kind of physical uh, characteristics of a qubit. And then, but it, it so, and so people are computing what, what, like, what wavelength of light you need to, to excite these atoms in these specific states. And, uh, and then uh, it's up to my team to, to actually, they say, okay, we, we want to uh, put the, say, put the, put the atom from the ground state to the like minus nine halves excited state, right? So then that translates to my team and to, you have to give it a kick of 100, mega, 100 megahertz RF pulse to a, something that controls the laser so that it gives that atom that kick. But as far as the actual details of, of the uh, gate schemes, uh, it, it's probably will take longer than we have here, and I'm probably not the right person. But if you look in our our preprint that uh, just came out, there's a nice diagram that describes exactly like how we make our one qubit gates. So I can refer you to that. So yeah, yeah, good cue. Thank yeah. you. All right. Um, I just wanted to talk for a, a minute about a group we have called Women in Quantum. This is a worldwide group with about 9,000 people in it. And we've had to date uh, four virtual summits, a couple in-person summits. We do annual awards. We do scholarships where we send people to go to scientific meetings or trade shows. So it's just a really great group I want you to all be aware of. We use this group as a way to highlight women's contributions in quantum computing, but everybody's welcome to come. So all you guys are welcome to come. We, we'd love to include you. Um, I wanna go to the next slide and talk real quickly. Um, what we have is a mentoring program. So this is something that we started offering six or nine months ago. Next slide. And it's sponsored by a company called Keysight Technologies. And essentially what's happened is we have people all around the world that have signed up to be mentors and signed up to be mentees. And we have some very accomplished people as mentors like Will Oliver from MIT or Jay Lowell from Boeing, um, the head of applications, Anne Matsura at Intel. So we have this wonderful group of mentors. And what we do is as you sign up, we match you with mentors and we give you the opportunity to spend 30 to 60 minutes with them every month and get their advice, whether it's on what's your next career step, whether it's science, whatever it is, we try very hard to match you with people of like interests. And it's just a great program open to everyone for free. So if you wanna take advantage of it, we literally match every Friday. So uh, you have time before the next batch if you wanna join us. Um, finally, I want to talk, there is a newsletter, and I don't have the URL on here, but I can share it with Nathan. Um, Oak Ridge National Labs shares a newsletter um, that you open it up and it looks like it just has like industry news. And then you page down and you page down and you page down. And they list 
conferences, jobs. They list, for example, 92 new quantum jobs last week. They list every single one of them. There's 1,245 current jobs open. They list every single one of them. It is the best go-to resource to look for internships, to look for postdocs, for faculty positions. It's all in one place. It's free, comes out every Sunday morning. So for those of you that I saw in the chat that were asking questions on what are the jobs, what do I need to get a job, this is a really great one-stop place to go to check out jobs. And also to learn more what people are looking for. It's just, it's really great to read. All right, wanted to say thank you. And if there's any other questions, I'm hoping I'm finished on time. So uh, thank you very much for um, listening, everyone. Enabling anyone in the world with an internet connection to learn about and leverage this game-changing technology. Um, in addition to Strangeworks, Orly has founded Chaotic Moon Studios, uh, Honest Dollar, Ecliptic Capital, and philanthropic efforts, including CERN's Entrepreneurship Student Program and Equals, the Gender Partnership for Gender Equality in the Digital Age. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Worley. Thank you. Okay, so first, fair warning. Um, I'm just now showing up because we're always back to back to back, and I will be leaving you as soon as I'm done. So if anyone online or in the audience wants to find me, I'm just at Whirly everywhere, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere. And my email is just Whirly, W-H-U-R-L-E-Y at strangeworks.com. Um, so I'm going to go through this a little fast because I was hoping to hold for questions at the end. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the software side of the house, but I don't know what questions you have. So I didn't want to make a super generic presentation. So I was talking to Nathan about giving an overview of kind of the industry, where it's at, who the players are, all that good stuff. We'll get through all of that. But I really want to know who in here, show of hands right now, wants to work in quantum computing that knew that before they came in the room. I would like resumes from all of you and anyone online that's holding up their hand, which is awkward because they're probably by themselves. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, oops, sorry. Did you take Maybe we'll get started. There we go. We can just do that. So the first thing I want to do is talk about software. And so I love software. I'm not on the hardware side. I'm not a physicist. I don't know enough about any of that. Uh, but software is like my favorite thing in the world because software has one mission and one mission only, and that's to eliminate complexity. And the reason we started a company in quantum computing was kind of threefold. One. Uh, we sold our last company to Goldman Sachs in a one-year anniversary, and while that was really great and fun, uh, it, it was also like uh, we didn't really get to build everything we wanted to build. Uh, two, we wanted a big field that had a long you know, future. So didn't want to get in something on the tail end, wanted to get something on the very beginning. Uh, I think Scott said expectations appropriately, as did Denise. We're in the very early days. I mean, this is, it's amazing. And three, um, quantum has a lot of complexity, and in that complexity, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to apply software, whether it be down in the firmware level or the control systems, to noise control, all the way up through the stack to the user interfaces and abstraction layers. There is a ton of opportunity. And what's awesome about being here on campus or when I'm on any campus is that all of you are living in the greatest time to be alive in the history of the world. When I went to start stuff technologically, I would have to cut UPC codes out of serial boxes and then go to a physical email box where I drop it in and wait 12 weeks to get something. You guys can fire up an Amazon cluster more powerful than most corporations had 10 years ago in about 30 minutes. Uh, you have access to free computers through Strangeworks, through IBM, through everything. So it's an incredible time to be alive and be around this. And so let's talk about what the industry looks like and then specifics on the software industry. Um, how many of you have been following Quantum for more than a year? Why did you not raise your hand saying you wanted a job in quantum? Are you just lurking? Because I counted all the hands first time, and then I counted all the hands there. There were seven of you that didn't raise your hand. So look at you specifically. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so when we first started, um, we started as a Linux Foundation project. Uh, the idea was that I would leave Goldman, and this would be one big open source set of software. But due to a bunch of reasons, we started it kind of looked like this. There was no software. There was all hardware, all hardware investment. And there was software being used, but there weren't really any software companies. And around the same time, 
uh, QCWare and Zapata and ourselves and a few others kind of became like some of the early software companies. And that led to this today. So there's now over 229 startups worldwide that we watch and try to monitor as best we can. There were three primary technologies for building these machines. There are now nine uh, that we interoperate with. There were no publicly traded companies. There's now three, about to be four uh, at the end of summer. Um, $20 billion invested by governments all around the world. Uh, those 37 master degree programs, there were only four when we started. Uh, so this is a, a lot of change for three years. We just turned four in March, and I'm astounded at the level and the pace with which things are accelerating in the space. That doesn't mean I think Scott would agree that this is, uh, you know, you're gonna make billions next year in it. I mean, this is still a very long-term game, but that's a super exciting uh, place to be in, a super exciting place to be in, in in the industry. So, whoops, sorry about that. So where exactly are we? Well, when we started, it was hard to figure out where to start. That's gotten a little bit easier. Um, there were a bunch of companies, so it was really easy to get confused, and that's primarily about kind of the news. So as you've seen, um, some people in companies say, we've just made this huge quantum breakthrough, and then some professors at certain universities write blog posts, and maybe, maybe not. And so th there's a lot of confusion. If you're an enterprise customer, or if you're wanting to get into quantum, it's hard to know sometimes where to get your information. What to, for example, there's several reports that there was $421 million spent in quantum last year. I'm here to promise you, there was not. That is incorrect. <laughs> at best. That doesn't mean it's not the most exciting space in computer science to be in. It just means, you know, we need to be a little factual with that. But the news was confusing, then it's still confusing. Then getting the rug pulled out from under you has gotten a little better. But it used to be you'd be using a framework, it would get updated, what would happen, your stuff would break, you'd have to go redo it. It's getting a little better, but interoperability between frameworks, still not great. Everybody wants to be the one, just like the hardware side. Um, using more than one frameworks, almost all the time when you're working with these. So it's really important to be able to tie all of that stuff together. The most important thing is the pricing model. Um, until Rigetti went on Amazon, it could be millions of dollars or you could use it for free, but many of the people offering the machines for free had a user license agreement that said anything you ran on the machine, they could patent. So not free. So that's changed a lot. And Amazon has taken that down. I think Rigetti's still around 30 cents a shot. So there's plenty of options free options, people looking for people to test, stuff that you can pay cheap. There's no reason not be playing with these machines today, and there's plenty of machines to play with. Um, the thing that gets me excited is quantum investment. Now, there's still not a lot of software investment, okay? Uh, but there's a ton of opportunity, and if we look at it, we can look at it this way. 2015 through 2021, venture investment was total about $1.4 billion. And you can kind of see 2017, which is where we started looking at forming, there was a little bit of an uptick, right? The drop back down in 2018, that's when we got our funding uh, around January. And then now, look at that. I mean, 2020 was a hell of a year, right? Not so much. In 2021 alone, there was 3.2 billion invested in quantum companies. Okay, now this includes SPACs and venture investment and private equity investment. But a, mil a billion of that, rather, was all in the last three months of the year. So think about that, 1.4 billion from 2015 until 2020, 3.2 billion the next year. So we doubled the amount of investment in quantum technologies and startups, from a, not from a government standpoint. We're not talking about the billions, tens of billions governments are putting in. We're just talking about people trying to make money on a hot quantum startup, okay? that went from 1.4 billion from 2015 to 2020 to 2.2 billion in the first three quarters and a billion in the second. That is quite a pace of investment, which either means this is gonna be hot or there's a whole lot of Quibi and Thernos on that chart, but I don't know, we'll see. You guys do follow business news, right? Just double checking. Just so you know, everybody in the audience thought that was hilarious, that's online. I know what your problem is. So let's talk about the players for a little bit. And again, I'm going to rocket through this so we get some questions. All of these people are playing, and all of them are doing interesting things, including the hardware companies listed on here, in software. 
So when I wanted to talk about software, I don't want to just talk about, you know, what Blue Cat's doing in Japan or One Qubit up in Canada or us or anybody. There's software up and down and all around the stack, and there are a ton of opportunities. Opportunities to write compilers, cross compilers, opportunities to write control systems. It goes on and on and on and on. There is a green field if you want to write software for you to write software for quantum computers. Everything that we have today is great. It's nowhere near what we need to have, and it will change so much between now and a general purpose quantum computer that it'll look like a completely different industry almost in my opinion. So what are some examples of what people are doing with quantum software? Well, as, um, and what was your name? All the way in the back, it showed me the picture of me. Yes. Jess, okay, so Jess was like, hey, is this you? Embarrassing, it's a picture of me at South By with Mayor Pete apparently wearing the exact same thing I'm wearing today. So he showed me the picture, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but the reason I was talking to Mayor Pete is one of the first areas that could be quantum, although there's chemistry and all these things, is actually transportation industry. And not just because you know, of logistics and routes, but also because of new chemistry for concrete and asphalt and things that are more environmentally friendly, right? Tons of reasons. So I wanted to share what some people are doing, and then I wanted to jump into Q&As and make sure we answer any of your software questions directly. And that should, if I do this, put us through right about on time. Um, so Volkswagen. Uh, they're doing some really cool stuff. Um, so is BMW. A lot of the German auto manufacturers, Audi, working on stuff too, are doing really, really cool stuff. Volkswagen um, particularly has been working on what? Uh, traffic management, optimization. Um, you know, quantum is, is pretty decent at that. It's not bad. Airbus is not just using quantum computing. They're using quantum computing. Uh, they're using sensors. Um, they're using communications to build all of their next-gen technologies. So... This, you know, it brings up an interesting question, which is, you know, quantum software is, is not just quantum computing, right? It's software for taking in sensor data or pre-processing sensor data. It's software for managing telecommunications over, you know, entangled networks, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the opportunity I talked about a moment ago was just in the computing side. There are what you might consider two whole other industries in kind of quantum information systems that are now burgeoning that might provide even more opportunities for software. Sorry, I'm so hoarse. MasterCard, uh, they're doing customer experience work. Um, this is really interesting. <clears throat> I've been approached by, since we started the company, by tons of ad and media companies wanting to know how they could crunch data to better identify customers and, and do all of that. It, it's, it's an interesting play. Um, it's also popular in loyalty programs. Um, where they're looking at, you know, how do they figure out either probability of people buying stuff, probability of people accepting offers, things like that. Probably not what I would use quantum computing for. I like the environment, the chemistry, and the material science and stuff, but, you know, still valid. Speaking of the environment, Total has been using it for, to create new algorithms for their CO2 capture, which is super cool. Um, I think the environment is one of the biggest opportunities for quantum computing, um, hands down. Uh, and uh, that's not just this environment, but, you know, Cyber Rodeo was Thursday, we were out there, and uh, great, we want to go to Mars. Well, there's also a lot of environmental problems there. So I think these new computers are the key to our future. What I mean by that, it won't just be quantum, there'll be amorphic, neuromorphic, DNA, maybe plant-based stuff one day. But if you think about it, there was an industrial age that revolutionized the world, and then there was an information age that did that again, I think now we're looking at the quantum age. I think quantum sensing and networking and computing are going to be what builds trillions of dollars worth of value in markets in the future. So I think it's super, super important to be looking at uh, the long-term view on this. I mean, you shouldn't have a two, three-year view of, hey, I'm gonna get out of school, what am I gonna do? You should have a 10, 20, 30-year view of how you're gonna make your mark on history because while I'm too old for that, Everyone in this room has a chance, except for Steve and me. <laughs> and uh, Toshiba, we talked about communications. Um, they've got a really great software doing a quantum key distribution. Uh, Quantinium, likewise, has quantum keys that were generated on a quantum computer that you can get through an API service. Tons of stuff happening right now today. Um, AT&T, telecommunications networks. Um, they have to figure out what's next, right? Because what does SpaceX do? They're not a space company. They're a telecommunications company. 
That's why they're launching thousands of satellites. They're going to put AT&T and Comcast and everybody out of business. So they're looking at what's next. Well, what's next for telecommunications? Quantum communications, right? Quantum networks. So the last thing I want to talk about, I want to rocket through this really fast, and then I want to get to a few Q&As. I brought some books, so we'll get to that in a minute, is why Austin? Now, I know this is being broadcast online. It's not just here. I understand that Austin is not the center of the universe, and I really wish everybody would stop moving here. But uh, it looks like I could be wrong because it does look a little bit like it. So one of my goals is I would like to make Austin one of the centers of quantum computing. Now, when I say that, understand that every quantum computing company, including us, has employees all over the world. There are maybe two or 300 people still that matter in quantum worldwide that really matter. Maybe 2,500, 3,000 if you were just crazy and counted every employee and whatever. There are going to be hundreds of thousands of jobs in quantum information science and in quantum computing easily. Okay. And so I want us to make a mark here in Austin, but like I said, that doesn't mean everybody's going to be here. It does mean if you ever come to work for us and you're out on the internet there, you get to come and visit Austin, which is super cool. And I like it because, again, you don't move here, and then you go back. So it's great. But this is just some of the stuff that's happening here right now. Um, 1,800 new hires from Samsung, 25 for Oracle, 15,000 Apple is going to go to, 5,000 for Tesla. Um, it, it's amazing. There's gravity. And the reason I bring this up is because Centers of gravity matter. It's valuable to Silicon Valley. It's valuable to Austin in the next phase of technology, meaning that companies here, I think, will have an advantage in working with some of the companies up there. Because I think interpersonal communication, even though we live in a world of Zoom, is, is really important. I travel all over the world to try to meet our clients and, and friends around. And when I say we want to make it Austin, we want to kind of take all of the building connections and, and the talent we have here and the quantum ecosystem and kind of tie them all together. Again, people won't move here to work for me. Some people will, not everybody will. Some people can't. I have engineers in Minneapolis. I have engineers in Dusseldorf, Germany. We have people everywhere. And that's kind of what you're thinking the company co uh, compositions will look like. So we built the ecosystem. I'm not gonna talk about it a lot, but if you wanna go play, you can go to quantumcomputing.com. And there's a simple code library, a web-based ID and some hardware to look at. And the thing I want to end with before we go to Q&A and giving away some books here is uh, we're hiring, um, which is something everybody's asked us for three years. And we said, no, we're not hiring. <laughs> so if you are interested, you can go to strangeworks.com, pound resume, okay, slash pound resume, and just start filling out an application. We'd love to talk to you because uh, we're definitely recruiting. We're definitely recruiting very heavy. And we're definitely recruiting worldwide. Now, you may live in a geography where we're not set up to do business. Um, that's not a problem. We've set geographies up to hire the right talent. So if you're the right talent and you're out there, don't worry about moving to Austin or where you're at. We're willing to talk to you. And like I said, it's a global market and global competition. So um, software questions. We have five minutes, maybe a little more. You can't raise your hand that early. What'd you say? Were you, were you ver Oh, okay. He's got, and I was going to say, if you're online, Steve is here. And he is, I think, posted if you'll put your questions online, he will refer them to me. If you're online and it's a really good question, you are not getting a book today, but you can email me if you wrote down the email address later and I will send you one. Um, you had a question first. We'll, we'll do his and then you're online and go back. Yes, sir. All right. So my question is regarding the thoughts on potentially building operating systems for quantum computers in the future, whether that be text-based, graphically, graphical. Give me that microphone. Operating systems. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> the problem with operating systems, you hit my pet peeve. I'm much bit, we don't even have RAM for these computers, right? There's not even a form of memory. So please continue, but know that this answer is going to be like in 30 years, all right? <laughs> Look, um, when people say they're building operating systems today, which is, by the way, a great question, my least favorite question, but you're going to get a book just because that's a, that, that, is, that is baller, and I didn't mean to, like, shell shock you or anything, but um, most of what they're talking about is system on a chip, right, which is not quite operating system. When I hear, I met with a company 
last year and there's like 12 of them. They're like, we're building a quantum OS. I'm like, for what computer? And they're like, for all of them. It's like, that's not how any of them work. <laughs> and I worked on the operating system team at Apple way, way back in the day. There were like thousands of people that worked on that. And it took years and years and years. I have to imagine this quantum thing is going to be significantly more complicated for that. Steve, what's the online question? Then we'll come back to the room. Well, I mean, I, I think that's everything. I think abstraction layers are desperately needed. Um, I see a couple different problems. One, if we had a million qubit machine today, we dropped it into Austin or London or Tokyo or New York or wherever, I don't know which one of us would program it. I, I think it, it might be infinitely more complex than we think. Um, I don't think it's simple as we did 10 gates, now we do a million gates. Um, you know, there's a very specific uh, approaches to solving problems here. Um, I think user interface, is what takes us from physicists to developers and eventually from developers to subject matter experts and eventually to just anybody that's an enthusiast that wants to play around with the tech. I think this is super, super important that we have these interfaces, that we have these abstraction layers. And I also think the interoperability between the machines, between the frameworks, all of that is something that we could definitely do a better job on. I'll come right back to you. I'm gonna go to you, sir, since you asked. Did you have a question too? I'll go to you too. Uh, the, the tech part. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, so the question was, um, what came first for you, the personal part or the technical part, right? Is that is that fair? Um, the, the technical part. Um, I used to be horrible and not like talking in front of people or anything. So that's that's parts all developed, as, as has the tech some, although I'm kind of rusty now, <laughs> for sure. Um, did you, Steve, have any more online before we... Kick, kick one out and then we'll come back to you. I didn't think it was you and then we'll come to you. Well, uh, challenge number one, we're writing software for computers that don't exist really. So that's always difficult. Um, I say that because a lot of these machines are more uh, great lab equipment for exploring the quantum landscape than, than computers. And I don't say that with any offense to any of my hardware friends. I say that because the decoherence times are still so short and the circuit times are still so long that a lot of times the machine isn't viable by the time you run a circuit. Um, and you know we have, we have a long way to go. For me, when we get to a general purpose quantum computer, we'll be there because then I can, at any time I want, call the one and it will process it and at some point give me an answer back. Um, but these aren't like you know a, a Dell 1U box. These are very complicated systems. And the people working on the hardware are extremely bright and talented and it's taking a long time because it is groundbreaking science. Uh, it's super cool. But, um, you know, we had a, you know, honestly, we've had a couple of problems. Um, one, it's been hard to be a software company in a hardware world for three years where we're saying we're building software for all of these users and people are like, but the machine doesn't work, <laughs> right? So that's been, that's been a little hard to get people like, yeah, yeah, we know, but it's going to take a long time for us to build this. And we think there's going to be a point where we we intercept that to, that market. Um, two, um, it's been hard finding people to get feedback from. There's not a lot of people in quantum computing, um, and there's not a lot of people that can give you really valid feedback from the software side or the physics side, right? Our joke when we started was uh, software engineers aren't really that great at physics, and physicists aren't that great at software engineering. It's like, I wrote quantum computing for babies. Doesn't make me Einstein or Schrodinger. You're a physicist and downloaded something off of GitHub. You're not a software engineer, right? We need to work together. We want to bring those two worlds together. And that was hard in the beginning when we were outsiders, but now it's gotten considerably easier as the pace of everything's picked up as well. Um, you're, you were next. And don't worry, I won't forget you. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a great question. Those industries, I think, will be primarily software driven. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, when I think of, of it, I think, you know, there, there's a guy at IBM that has made quantum music and there's people that have done, you know, the computer and stuff. When I think of a valuable technology, I think a lot of it in industries that are creative will be uh, used, not seen. So an example, your mom or grandma might use 
text messaging and autocorrect. And well, that will get eventually better, right, with a predictive probabilistic technology of what you're trying to do. Well, think about you're trying to quantize a song uh, that you're mastering or you're trying to move stuff. All of these things might, you know, come into play. I have heard people say there'd be a desktop computer in five years. I don't know that I'm on that bus. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that when you think about creative technologies, it'll be things that you take advantage of that you don't see behind the scenes for now. More importantly, what the future brings, I don't know. There's a guy that I'm helping in Miami who has a crazy ambitious music and art project uh, where he thinks that, you know, you can use an algorithm to predict mood and you come into the room and the whole thing is basically like a almost a holodeck kind of thing. I don't know about any of that. I mean, for right now, these machines are, are really for very, very specific problems. They're not gonna make the cat video on the internet faster. Uh, they are gonna make a new material science for you know cars and planes and spaceships or whatever. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't, but quantum computing is not island to itself. It's really, really important to understand that this technology integrates with other technologies. You can't use a quantum computer today without the classical side. Most people running stuff are running classical to quantum and back, right? And that will expand and get, get more complex. So, um, I mean, in a dream world, I would love to see quantum everything, right? But I don't know how much those industries will be affected on the you using quantum versus the, say you're searching through a catalog of music um, and they can have, you know, Google's applied Grover search algorithm and has a discography and now you can search more efficient and find what you're looking for for the new mix or whatever. That's what I say when I say you'll, you'll be affected by it, but not necessarily directly using it in, in those kind of things. Let's go to, I, I didn't mention who it was other than Miami, sorry, because NDA and stuff, but there's, there's some cool stuff going on. Let's go to you, because you had a question. Um, oh, I, I guess you briefly covered it, but um, how do you expect to continue developing the software if the appropriate hardware doesn't exist? And how do you continue that development? And I guess also, how do you, how in the future would you like plan to integrate the hardware with the software when like, the hardware is not properly like functioning to like meet the software developing needs. So, so the question for, for the people online is around how do you develop software like when we started three years ago when the computers kind of really aren't there? Um, and it depends on the software you're developing, right? Obviously, for years and years now, we've needed control systems and, and then, you know, pulse control and, and things like that. So, you know, there's been software development. When we say software, we do mean what that other question online was. We mean more general um, you know, user interfaces and integrations of different things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but look, it, it's been difficult, but now it's gotten easier because now there's 229 companies, not 12, and there's a lot of pro progress. The hardware has progressed. Think about this. Solvay, fifth Solvay Conference, 1927. Thought of quantum. 1985, Minim Benioff, let's use a block here basically as a bit, right? Fast forward to 2012, uh, MIT has like 12 qubits, okay? 2017, we went from 12 to 15 to 17 to 60 to hundreds. Um, you know, you heard Denise's machine uh, earlier. I think you said the 100 qubits out now, right, Denise? Right? Um, you know, IBM has 127. You have others. And, and this is the danger, the warning. Uh, qubit number irrelevant, right? Because 5,000 qubits on annealer is not like 100 qubits on Denise's machine is not like 127 on IBM's, right? These, these all mean different things. But as it's progressed, it's got, uh, got considerably easier. Now, I had, you had a question. Okay, you have a question, you have a question, you have a question. You were next, so I'm gonna go to you, and then to Steve, and then to you, and then to you. I think that's everybody, right? Nobody over there? And then you, yes, sorry, <laughs> good. I know Strangeworks offers support for like different languages like uh, Qiskit, or SDKs like Qiskit and Qsharp. Um, can you say, or are you allowed to say like which one has been like the, uh, easiest to integrate from like Strangeworks side or like from the user side? No, man, they're, they're like the little Lebowski urban achievers. Proud we are of all of them. Um, no, I'm not going to pick a favorite. <laughs> um, they've all been stupidly hard to integrate. <laughs> That's the reality. <laughs> um, but good, but good, good question. Steve, got anything from online? So right now with the platform, you can go to quantumcomputing.com, use pretty much a ton of the frameworks on a ton of targets, simulators, emulators, machines. Um, our original goal was humanizing quantum, which was to make it, you know, again, 
out of the hands of the physicist, into the hands of developers, eventually out of the hands of developers, in the hands of, of everybody. I mean, think about it. 20 years ago, when you were in college, not taking CS, you probably didn't code. Now you're building websites and doing stuff and everything. We want to drive it. That's why we wrote Quantum Computing for Babies. We want to drive this. I do believe this, not AI, is the space race of our generation. And it is vitally important that we get it distributed as widely as possible, that we have as much open knowledge as possible. And that's kind of what the platform started as and about. Now we've advanced that a lot since then, but the whole focus is still making sure that we make it very easy for companies and people that want to adopt quantum computing to be able to get into it and get up and running with it fast and get benefits from it as well. Um, I think it was you, sir, that I said I was going to go to next after him. Um, some of the other things that we use, Penny Lane, uh, Strawberry Fields, uh, but I'm wondering where uh, academia is gravitating towards, because I know I spend probably half my time just setting up my local <laughs> box just to get it to work with a simulator. Well, sounds like you need strange works. <laughs> but <laughs> seriously, um, the, question, the question for online was, which, where do I see academia leaning? He was saying he uses CERC, he uses uh, KizKit, et cetera. Um, I think that, uh, so... Prevailing wisdom would tell you that the hardware and the software will be consolidated, right, over time. That's true if we're at the point where there was an actual industry. We're pre that point. We're not in the time of AMD versus Intel. We're in the time of like vacuum tubes, you know, versus little electrical gates or whatever. It's still early on. Now it's moving super fast. And if you got involved today and it hit in three years or five years, you would still probably potentially be behind, right? Like it's, it's going. Um, but as far as academia, I, I think that, you know, what I see most popular is definitely KizKit. IBM is a huge university program. Uh, Denise was probably partially responsible for that, I think, and getting it to all the universities. Um, but, you know, KizKit, Cirque, uh, Forest, I see Ticket, you know, I see a, a number of the frameworks. It depends on what you're trying to do and the research you're trying to do. Some of these are better for some things than they are for others, just like the machines. Um, so, you know, where does it go? I, I don't know, but I don't think you're going to see that consolidation for a while. I think you're going to see a proliferation of new hardware types. We went from kind of three to nine. I think there's going to be even more. Um, Nick Farina in Chicago, for example, uh, using helium electrons, um, you know, uh, the topological qubits, the silicon spin stuff. None of that was really going, you know, last year or the year before in any like, hey, we're going to do a thing. And still could be some of those a year or two away. Uh, but that's going to mean more frameworks to deal with those. And so I think it's going to expand more. So I see academia having to figure out how do they build coursework around maybe the top two or three or something, uh, you know, moving forward. Uh, now, where did he go with Mike? He's uh, right there. I'm going to go to your question. Yes, ma'am. But he's bringing you a mic, I think. And then since you're right there, we'll go, we'll go to Hello? you when she gets my mic. Go for okay, it. so I've never used a quantum computer before, and I've never like, uh, I guess like access one. So, what do commands look like uh, for a quantum computer? Like Python? Okay. Yeah, but it's flashing red, the battery warning light. <laughs> okay, so to answer your question, it looks like a lot of Python right now, right, for the most part. Um, so it's, it's Python language. You're usually instantiating, uh, you know, either entanglement or teleportation or something. It depends on what you're doing. So like Shor's algorithm, for example, is super simple, most of it. And then there's one step we're trying to order the number of what is in that, that key you're trying to decrypt. But when you're calling it, I think this is part of the limitation of quantum, is that right now it still requires, in the early days of computing, you had to be an electrical engineer to understand the flow of electricity between the gates to program a machine. Today, you need to have some physics knowledge. It's extremely hard still to do anything significant without having that physics knowledge. And so right now, I would say that could, I don't think it's daunting, depending on your experience with programming and stuff, but I think that you know it's almost all Python in the frameworks you're using. It's all calls that you're calling this stuff that you can't really go further than. So for example, um, in Microsoft's uh, format, you can call a teleportation call, but if you go, you know, if it, if it breaks on you, there's, you know, you're sending stuff to these machines. Already you're seeing that get easier. So for example, uh, IBM has introduced runtimes. 
So they're taking the circuits that have been designed that you would normally set up on your machine and do the calls and putting them resident on the quantum computer so that you're just doing an API call to it. And I would be willing to bet that in the next 16 months, the majority of what you'll see will be you making an API call, calling an actual function. So maybe it's a variational quantum eigen solver or maybe it's a QAOA or something like that, but you won't, you'll be more working with the data set and setting the parameters and, and making that call as opposed to writing uh, that software yourself. Wait, like quick follow up here. So, sure. so are these calls like measurements? Like, like are these kind of like the commands we're talking about? Yeah, you could measure you could measure things, but like the variational quantum eigen solver measures the minimum Hamiltonian value uh, eigen value of a Hamiltonian, right? So there's there's all I mean it's literally the same. You're just calling a different machine. Um, it's all I think Python again is going to be dominant. I think when you look at it. Um, I don't think you're going to get a chance. I, I hope you don't get a chance to go into the low-level programming unless you're doing controls and like, uh, for example, if you're using um, open pulse. So you're then making calls to basically change the, the pulse of the microwaves on the IBM machine, right? Um, I think that that's fascinating stuff. I don't think 99% of people who have data and have a purpose for using quantum would know about microwave pulses. <laughs> so I think you're gonna see this be a world where it's a lot of API calls. It's gonna look a lot like REST. It's gonna look a lot like when you set up an AWS service, right? You're gonna say, I need to orchestrate something between these machines and there's already wrappers for that and you'll just call the wrapper and then you do an API call and tie in your data. That's not exciting, but that's where it needs to go to get adopted. Because if we depend on where it is current state for quantum computing to take off as an industry, we are a couple million people and 20 years behind it being use usable, right? We're gonna have to advance it to make it as easy to use as when you're deploying a web server or deploying other services. So that's what my hope is. And so I, I'm trying to put the kibosh on, you know, all the multiple languages and all the frameworks. I think it should be more managed services and API calls um, because I think that's the majority of users are not physicists and they're not even software developers. Um, we, can, we can see there's, I mean, out of those 313,000 people, Denise, is that the number you said? I think 313,000 you said? 325,000, even more, I was off. Uh, if you think about those 325,000 people, I would, how many do you think would be physicists, Denise? Seven, 20, <laughs> 30? I mean, it's really, it's really, there's a big delta between what you do now and like where I'm hoping to take things and where we're hoping as a team to take things in just the next few short years. Um, I'm gone over, but that's okay. I know you have, he's gonna be the, the last question and I'm gonna pass a couple of these out. This yeah. is, I'll, I'll come, I'll get it to you. Go ahead, what's uh, your I question? just had a small question about something on the side. So you mentioned- Which like, slide? Uh, you mentioned MasterCard and Airbus are all trying to use quantum technologies. Uh -huh. um, so given the fact that none of these machines are actually practical for doing almost anything useful. Still practical for building intellectual property and running experiments on. I see. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, I get that question a lot. <laughs> right. And the, yeah, the question was, given the machines aren't really at a stable state uh, to be doing massive calculations and stuff on, why are these companies wasting any time with it? And it's because these companies see it coming. They're building IP around it. They're, some of them are trying to patent algorithms. I don't think you should do that, but that's you know, to each their own. Um, but you know, they're building intellectual property, they're building programs, training people on how to use machines, answering the questions she asked. How do I program it? What calls am I making? What's going on? And, and by the way, that shifts depending on where you're at in the stack and, and what tools you're using. Uh, but that's, that's why they're using them because Airbus, Volkswagen, all of these companies, they see a change coming, that kind of quantum age that I talked about. And if they're not already there and don't already have a team and have the knowledge, then they're gonna be left way, way behind. And so you see a lot of the companies that think pretty far in advance have already been playing with this for years. BMW is a, a great example. Um, in fact, they're one of the organizations behind the Munich Quantum Center. Um, or wait, Munich Quantum Valley, right, Steve? That's what they call it. Yeah, Munich Quantum Valley. You gotta stop seeing the center. All right, well, I apologize, but I went, 10 minutes over what I thought it would. Okay, one, one more question in back. Go for it. We're bringing you a mic. This is gonna be, have to be the last one though. Um, what are your opinions on what a potential quantum architecture would look like? For software or for hardware? Hardware. I have no idea I'm not in hardware. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I mean, look, it'll, it'll, it'll I, I think right now what you see is you see a lot of bump bonding, uh, right? 
so between the quantum chip and the and the and the uh, classical compute uh, side of it, um, I think the architectures, like I said, we had three when we started. There there were more, but there weren't anybody really working in funding. Now there's nine. I think there'll be 16, 18, 20. There's a bunch of ways to work with these particles, and everybody has a different way, whether it's silicon spin or ion traps or superconducting or you know annealing or whatever. And I think you're going to see more. Um, the architectures fascinate me, even though that's nowhere near my area of expertise. But I really, really think that uh, there's not going to be a consolidation. And I don't know two things about hardware architecture. One, I don't think all hardware will be good for all quantum computing challenges. I think some things will be better at some things and some things will be better at other things. Um, and two, I think the more proliferation of hardware you could have right now is actually better. As long as we can get the abstraction layers to have as many people as possible playing with it and giving it feedback. Because one of the things I think that's held back the hardware side is, you know, there hasn't been a lot of software interest. And so how are you going to get it to a user and test it? Uh, Steve came up with a wonderful program called Backstage Pass, uh, where you apply and you get access to hardware early and uh, you get to give them the feedback and, you know, you get vetted and stuff. That loop has kind of been missing. Um, there's an argument to say it hasn't because there's obviously software people I know that were working in quantum years ago, which is how I got inspired to get into it. Uh, but the hardware architectures, I think they look dramatically different in the future than they do now. Uh, I be do what? Gibson. His phone number is 512. His wife's phone number is 512. <laughs> Um, but but this is really important note on, on the hardware architectures and like where is it all going? That's why I think all of you should be involved in quantum right now today is you could be driving where that architecture is going. You know what I mean? This is amazing ground floor opportunity. I think that superconducting and ion traps will, will kind of rule the day. Uh, I think the annealers will fade away um, eventually. Not fade away, be gone, but like Fujitsu and Itachi have digital annealers and emulators that are almost as good as their own machines but they're a fraction of the cost. So clearly they have a, a cost advantage, right? I mean, one of the big things with hardware is return on investment. If you're gonna try to buy a machine, it's tens of millions of dollars. Uh, nobody in the enterprise is gonna do that anytime soon. I mean, maybe in a rounding error on a government sale or something, okay? Um, but you know, we need to get the cost and access free or cheap. We need to get the educational resources much, much lower in our education system globally, but especially here in, in the US. Um, and then we need to focus on you know, what are we actually doing to drive a return on, on investment? Um, I think that is the number one key question for all of quantum is, great, I'm going to spend $25 million with you, and then I'm going to spend millions of dollars setting up a team and do all this stuff. How does it actually improve my business? How do I get a return? And that sucks because it's such a capitalist thing to say, but the fact is, is I'm not going to be able to sell any software if I can't tell them that, and you're certainly not going to be able to sell them any hardware. But again, it is a ground floor opportunity. I mean, yeah, there's a ton of companies formed already. There's a ton of stuff going on. None of us are guaranteed to be successful, guys. None of us. We could be out of business in a month. We could be ruling the world. So could 229 other companies I told you about, right? Or 100 new companies that'll form this year that we don't even know. Maybe it's your hardware company. You know, this is an incredible opportunity to get involved at the ground floor of this technology. And I would urge you to not pass it by. Um, again, I'm worthy everywhere. We're 20 minutes over now. Thank you for all the questions. So thank you very much. You guys have a great day. <laughs>